Welcome to Unemployed. This week, I am honored to have my, my friends at musical cohorts in uh, Levi Clay and Mike McLaughlin, two gentlemen that go under the banner of The Guitar Souls on a wonderful podcast uh, that's going weekly now. One of my favorites to listen to. Uh, these guys are really, uh, you know, they've done a lot of stuff in terms of keeping the guitar community honest, <laughs> criticizing uh, where uh, it needs to be criticized. And uh, Great group of guys. I'm glad we don't live any closer because I'm sure our wives and significant others would frown upon how much time we'd waste together. <laughs> but uh, here we are, guys. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, why, don't, why don't we go around? You guys uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourselves and uh, we'll get into this whole thing. This is where I just jump in and take control like I do mm -hmm. on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, my name is Levi Clay. I am one of the hosts on the Guitar Souls podcast, which is basically a Bash Gibson podcast. Uh, it seems to be what it is most, <laughs> most weeks, laughing at the ridiculous things that Gibson have been doing. But outside of that, I've been working as a transcriber and writer and teacher and all of that stuff in uh, various aspects of the music industry for a very, very long time. Very long time. Big fan of Tom. Big fan of Thank You Scientist. Got to, got to meet Tom my first time out at NAMM. And uh, yeah, been good friends ever since. Love him very much. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to be here. So thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks for doing it. Michael, you're up. Hello. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike. I am the other co-host of the Guitar Souls podcast. Sadly for Levi, having to put up with my shit constantly. Uh, I also play guitar in Party Cannon, uh, which is a indecipherable ever moving rumble of noise essentially <laughs> uh, recently i have been working on learning party canon songs and being sick other than that <laughs> not much to report <laughs> yeah i feel like this is the the classic tom on to luck in that i you know i try hey let's let's make plans and do something immediately uh both of you guys get deathly ill and uh so i'm sorry about that i'm glad to see you guys both in one piece but it was like uh it, it was just incredible i'm like of course that happens of course they both get some kind of bizarre illnesses it, and it's funny you say you say deathly ill um we should say not covid like <laughs> not oh yeah I, we do we do have to give that disclaimer for uh trust yeah. us to get deathly ill and it not be the thing that everybody else seems to be deathly ill yeah with. <laughs> it's it's not the other little pandemic that was going around it was something else so anyway i i brought these guys on and i thought it would be really fun to to kind of have a focused conversation on something and um you know i picked underrated metal albums because both of these guys have a pretty vast knowledge of metal coming from different places too and I like to think as someone who grew up listening to metal that I have a certain, you know, uh, knowledge of at least the period of metal. And um, I like talking about dark horse bands, you know, bands that didn't get enough credit. And, uh, you know, there's so much great stuff in metal and it's such like, um, it can tend to be a saturated sort of genre. So a lot of this great music can fly under the radar, whether it be just because it was a little ahead of the time or it didn't have the right push. Um, and, uh, I want to thank these guys for introducing me to some really cool music that, um, you know, maybe it was some stuff that I've had heard of peripherally, but never really sat down to listen to. And maybe I wouldn't have because of this. So uh, we, we all picked two albums that we thought were kind of underrated, um, underrated metal albums. And uh, we're just going to kind of talk about it and hopefully expose people to some cool stuff. So, uh, you know, I'll provide links to everything in the description of the video. You guys can, can wander. And I hope that everybody sort of has a conversation and maybe uh, in the comment section, you know, Tell me some other albums that we're missing. You know, we could have picked tons. I didn't want to do classic metal albums or influential metal albums because we probably would have been talking about the same albums that people <laughs> have talked about, like, you know, uh, in, in countless other YouTube videos. Like I said, I said to Mike and Levi the other day, like, the world needs me talking about how great Rust in Peace is, like, a, like a new <laughs> in my head, right? Um, but so, so we're trying to, you know, we're trying to avoid the obvious a little bit, maybe expose people uh, to some stuff that... Uh, kind of flew under the radar so i'd like to start uh we're gonna go round table style and we'll go uh one album piece until we we go around so i'd like to start with levi's first pick okay um i love this as a challenge actually it's, it's a, it was a lot of fun and stressful to think about because i think i'm similar to you in the respect that i have a uh, encyclopedic knowledge of metal up to a certain point uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. i've not been um I've not been in that genre for, for a very long time. So there are albums that I'm really, really passionate about. And then there's all this cool new stuff that Mike's constantly putting me onto or my pal Doug is putting me onto that I get to enjoy. Um, so I had to dig into my history. And what I've learned is actually, uh, I'm more of a rock guy than a metal guy. Uh, I, want, I was going to suggest uh, Black Label Society's first album, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I went with, I went one prior to that because of the vocal prowess shown off by Zach Wilde on the album Pride and Glory. Pride and Glory. Yeah, the self-titled no, album. Pride and Glory. So I know of Zach Wilde, right? Obviously. You can't play guitar and not know of Zach yeah. Wilde nowadays. Um, I was not familiar with this album, and I have a very sort of just spotty kind of knowledge of Black Label Society in that I've heard tunes, but I've never like fully explored it. I've, I've liked the tunes that I've heard. Uh, most of my Zach Wilde knowledge is from his time in Ozzy, and obviously No More Tears and that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, immediately, you hit the nail on the head. What struck me about this album that I did not expect is how great of a vocalist he is and how expressive, how dynamic, um, mm. and how he covers so much ground. Uh, you know, there were moments I was listening to it in the car with my girlfriend where we, I was driving home from a gig that she came to me with. Believe it or not, I had a gig. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she was like, wow, this guy sounds like Chris Cornell. And then, then she's like, oh, wow, this, he kind of reminds me of Jeff Buckley. And then, oh, he kind of reminds you know, and it was, it was funny that like, um, you know, Zach Wilde is someone I never really thought about him as a vocalist, but that was the thing that stuck out to me the most yeah. listening to this album. Um, the other thing I could say is that, um, you know, Basically, I would, I would describe Zach Wilde as not hair metal, but hair metal adjacent, right? Because he came up sort of at that Aussie period when, you know, mm. they had that sort of look. They had a little bit of that sound. You know, one could argue, I would say hair metal adjacent, if not hair metal, right? But the cool thing yeah. about this record is that he avoids the pitfalls of a lot of those hair metal adjacent musicians and where it doesn't sound 80s. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? Go on. Uh, and I was just going to say that, that is a kind of uh, a rarity for someone who came from that period because yeah. you always sort of have the stink of 80s in, in a yeah. lot of that stuff even when they try more modern stuff so that yeah. was surprising to me but uh, yeah you the thing you have to remember with zach is and especially listen to this album you can tell there's like a deep love of southern rock and country influences on there and that makes total sense being a boy from new jersey <laughs> of course yeah you know that <laughs> that, that classic new jersey style <laughs> the old country 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 bumpkin that he has <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um but <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. go on mike not to you i was just gonna say so uh in terms of like the vocal prowess you know alcohol really got the better of zach the uh -huh. the vocals on the first black label society album are still pretty good but they get progressively more more gruff as he goes on he did he put out a, a solo record called book, book of shadows just after the pride and glory before just after i'm sure it's after actually uh -huh. um after. and yeah, and it's the same kind of thing, mostly acoustic guitar and just him showing off his songwriting chops and his vocal chops. And I just, we'll see that when we look at my other album and the criticisms that I'm going to have of the other albums we listen to. Like I find more and more, I'm, I'm all about great singers, uh, great songs, and well, at least what I deem to be great songs. Uh, just somebody that can really capture you with, with the voice and the guitar playing is usually secondary to me, usually. You're going to mm -hmm. have hated all of my choices then. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Well, you know what, like I, um, yeah, it, it just, his voice really, really struck me on this. The guitar playing is great. And, and, and I think that um, I got a lot of stuff that I didn't formally hear from Zach, like more of like a, almost like Hendrix kind of, oh, yeah. kind of vibe, which is not something in, the, at least in the Black Label Society stuff that I heard, uh, wasn't really prevalent. And there's some great slide playing on this record. Mm -hmm. um, and just some real ferocious riffs. Like, I feel like Shine On, probably, if that got the right radio play, could have been a hit. I mean, this record is from 94. I pulled yeah. up my notes here, right? Um, I mean, that could have been, you know, a, a song on Bad Motor Finger with a little more, you know, Southern, southern attitude. But that, that could have been a single. Um, it's just, and I wonder, I don't, you probably know more about the circumstances of this record than me was this something that just didn't get the right kind of promotion the time it came out and or was it just sort of you know people weren't willing to accept the person that they saw in ozzy doing this southern rock kind of kind of thing it's really funny because like i've spoken to a bunch of people i've just mentioned pride and glory as a band in passing and they're a band that put out one record in 1994 and the sheer amount of older friends that i have that go oh yeah i remember seeing those guys live they were great mm -hmm. uh, i love that album i love that band and i'm like how did everybody seem to uh, at least over here in the uk that they played download um, and everyone or donnington at the time monsters of rock and uh yeah everyone seems to remember seeing them and thinking they were fantastic and i just don't know it, it can't be anything other than a decision to want to do something other than a rock band. Uh, yeah. You'd have to ask Zach on that one. Cause I, I really do. I really do think the songs are there. Yeah. It they're... seems like it was a right place at the right time record. So it's, it's not that all, all the parts are there, you know, to be uh, something that people would have jumped on, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 
you know, another another thing I really appreciated in listening to this record was the fact that a lot a lot of it is just the trio with no overdubs. A lot of times when he goes for a solo, there's no overdubs. I mean, there's a couple of moments later on the album where it has a little more rhythm overdubs, but I love the sound of just a raw power trio. Yeah. Um, and just like you could really focus on the guitar and he has a lot more nuance in his playing than I think what people give him credit for. Um, and his playing has certainly changed over the years. Uh, Ooh, yeah. This is before, you know, it became sort of a, a, a pinch harmonic kind of fest. And, and uh, <laughs> he, re he really lets the phrasing kind of, kind of roll out. And I think that, that he really shines and you can really take in just how beautiful his vibrato is and how um, he just really makes it sing. He, he plays the guitar just like he sings. Yeah. You know, he's got his vibrato is just like the way he plays it on guitar, which is really, really cool and really, really telling. But it's something that I enjoy in older bands. When I say older bands, whatever. Older metal bands like Pantera, for instance, how they don't feel the need to kind of have a, a rhythm guitar behind and just let the solo sort of breathe. And I think that's, that's really, really cool. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There, you guys now, have all the boxes as well, I was thinking. Like, yeah. I really like that the production's raw and the fact that you can hear a lot is Zach's real voice. He's not being touched up or anything. They've also not maybe done a lot of overdubs. Yeah. But as you're saying, like his vibrato is just killer. Absolutely killer. I think... It's maybe even a wee bit sad, and maybe that's a weird thing to say, but in the case that Zach could have went another direction and been a hit maker and made himself a lot of money for that, because that song is just hit after hit after hit. They're all catchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe not sad, but it's not as if he's had a bad career, but you know what I mean? Like, if, if he'd went his own way and just went, I'm going to be a songwriter, yeah. like whether I perform them or someone else does. I mean, in terms of Aussie guitar players, he's done all right post Aussie. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <not too> bad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, there, there was a couple. There was one tune on here that reminded me of uh, "Proud Mary." Was it "Sweet Sweet Jesus"? Has that Sweet sort of, kind of yeah, "Proud yeah. Mary" kind of thing going on? It was cool. It was just influences that I didn't really think were a part of his vernacular. You know. Yeah, and I wish he showed those influences more because uh, obviously. I think that's kind of musically one of the truest things he's ever put out. You know that's what he grew up listening to. You totally. absolutely know that all of those those more jam orientated rock bands uh that's him uh, because his playing is so authentic on it and I don't mean authentic uh like he plays like his influences but I mean you can tell that he's he's being himself he's having fun with it and he's yeah. become the black label society thing but I also think that when you when you're in a band as big and as popular as black label society and a huge part of black label society is the the image the marketing thing that goes with it you've got to steer into that to to you know maintain what the fans expect um so I feel he's playing that role more then Pride and Glory just strikes me as here's an, my my first record with a band that I'm going to put out, and you know here's here's me here's what I do here's what I want to do I love that it's just it's an honest record go check it out for fantastic. sure for sure <laughs> Mike you've been quiet up in there or should I say Nance you've been quiet up there uh, <laughs> I changed my name I changed that <laughs> <laughs> what a great what a great time to announce that to the world thank you <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this 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 one Mike what what uh I think my favourite track is the one that I was familiar with, which is Machine Gun Man, because of oh, the yeah. acoustic version, which is just fucking killer. And I think, see, when you hear the stripped back acoustic version and you put it against, like, the album version, I would go back to the acoustic stripped down version because it's just totally so soulful, man. It's so good. Yeah. And the fact that Zach's playing so soulfully, I don't know another word to put, with, with so much emotion and, like, feel in it. And singing over the top it and like really wailing as well, like riffing over the top it while he's singing. It's just tremendous, man. Tremendous. Yeah. For anyone unaware, that's a, an MTV Headbangers Ball video. And the beauty of it is now you can just go on YouTube and type that in. But back when I was a kid, uh, when we would use websites like, or, or sorry, uh, programs like Kazaa or, or, uh, or LimeWire to download stuff illegally, I'd look for Zach Wilde, I'd find this Machine Gun Man video and, you know, it would take four days to download or whatever. And uh, yeah, that was something that we just sort of huddled around a PC and watched it in very low grain, um, <laughs> low quality yeah. footage. If it just... even ended up being the video you intended to download by the time it <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, you, oh, yeah. you could get some horrible things looking for Machine Gun Man. Yes. Um, oh, man. Honestly, go, go and check that song out on YouTube, the, the, the live version from the MTV Headbangers Ball, because I, it's probably a nostalgia thing. I didn't get this record until a good few years after I'd seen that, that video. Mm. Uh, so to me, the original version will always be the live acoustic version. Um, and I have a there's a, a massive attachment to that song and yeah go check it out I, I gotta check that out I've never heard the acoustic version so no. I'm gonna oh, have man. to invest <laughs> so good. I know so I'm behind the time something, something but, to enjoy something to savor 
yeah. yeah. But so, so this record, I would say like, um, obviously, you know, I, I feel like if I could describe the sound, I would say like uh, a good reference point would be like if you took King's X, but replaced the gospel influence with Southern rock, um, mm. that, that kind of, you know, so fan, I feel like fans of that would like it. There, there was also a band from this era called Cry of Love that I'm a, a big fan of. Um, monstrous guitar playing on, on this Cry of Love record, but it, it, uh, and great vocals too. Um, to me, there, there's some common ground between those, those two things in, in that it's just ripping, just raw rock and roll, heavy blues influence. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, anybody who's into that sort of thing, this is a, a great record. And also, you know, would appeal to fans of Soundgarden and any kind of like grungy stuff of that era. So mm -hmm. good pick from Levi. Definitely, yeah. a, a, definitely a, a quality dark horse pick. And I, I enjoyed it. And, and one that I'll be coming back to, too, yeah. because, uh, you know. <laughs> There's some, uh, obviously, they're a jam band, really. Uh, not in the sense that we use the, the term jam but band. So I don't know exactly. why I used it. <laughs> I, I, no, no, but you're totally right. I could see them live it being a totally different experience than yeah. the studio record. Yeah. And there's a lot of good pro shot live footage of them uh, from back in that era from various festivals so if you enjoy the record go and check out some of the uh, live footage because they just they cook live they're just yeah yeah for great sure. man awesome so levi's first pick pride and glory zach wilde everybody check it out great record mr michael your first pick hello well i'm going to take things in a completely different direction as was expected <laughs> um with levi's obvious uh declaration for what he was looking for from these albums to be great i was not i don't imagine this is going to score very high with him but we'll see <laughs> which was a uh, Job for a Cowboy's fourth album, Sun Eater, which for anyone that's heard Job for a Cowboy, you've probably seen the meme for the Entombment of a Machine and you've heard Knee Deep, the big squeals, etc. But this album came out and absolutely blew me away. It was like a completely different direction for the band. They went really progressive with a lot of melody in there, very clever thought out riffs, a great production. The guitar tone's ridiculous. I'd never heard them have any solos across their music. Um, and previous albums that I've listened to and then all of a sudden, these absolutely ripping guitar solos over half the tracks, ferocious drumming, and then Johnny Davies' vocals, which are just unbelievable. It just blew the legs off me. And it was like, it's very much a, a Marmite album. I think people who were really into Job for a Cowboy either were really into it and thought this is a cool style to go in, like a really cool progression, um, or the exact opposite of, oh, what's this? It's not deathcore, but... Kind of uh -huh. it, it was so. i'll tell you mike the first thing when i listened to it i had heard job for a cowboy before but i had clearly heard i guess some of the early stuff which was a lot different than this yes um very much so, so. That, I, so yeah so the first thing that struck me is that um it kind of grooves for a lot of it a lot of it is kind of mid-paced groovy it's not like really like blasting your head off kind of stuff yep there's um, plenty of that in it but you're right there, yeah yeah it, well in terms of like you know what you think of death metal normally it was pretty uh on, on the groovier mid pace side, a lot of, a lot of the kind of stuff. Um, I did like uh, how in terms of a lot of death metal that I've listened to, because I, I, I was a death metal fan when I was a kid um, mm -hmm. and I, it's something I sort of fell off of, but I love the extreme. extreme <coughs> metal kind of thing when I was younger. <laughs> 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 um, I'm not going to say that, but leave it to <laughs> Levi. Um, uh, no, and there's some stuff that I still enjoy in that genre. Um, my main gripe with the genre as a whole is that maybe sometimes the songs really don't have an apex. Kind mm -hmm. of, it's just, it tends to be kind of like parts. Um, I do think these guys did a good job of getting the songs to kind of build to a definite climax um, mm -hmm. where they're really just not thinking about like the more is more kind of approach to, oh, this song will get better we just got to put 10 more riffs in it and There's that's got to good be 320 bpm blast yeah 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 why. yeah exactly yeah. exactly they're they're yeah. they are really thinking about the architecture of a song um which is uh is cool i mean it, it just makes those heavier moments more effective and i also really like the prominence of the bass which is something in death metal you don't get very often um there's a lot of moments where sort of the bass takes the forefront and i really really like that because i you know the death metal bands I love, like Cynic and Atheist and all that stuff, they all had this really prominent bass. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they'll go into these dynamic sort of sections where they have like this bass kind of chording and it kind of takes on like, like in the first track, for instance, it has a yeah. nice interlude. Um, and I just think it's cool. I mean, they definitely tried something different than just deathcore, which I appreciate. You know what I mean? It's sort of that genre tends to be a little dogmatic sometimes. And maybe if you yeah. try something new, the backlash can just be almost not even worth the effort, you know? 
But yeah, um, you in can terms, your sound in your fit that pocket, yeah. Ex- exactly, exactly. But it's cool that they are not afraid not afraid to not make the same album over and over again, which is some kind of a, an issue that I I have with a lot of death metal bands, and that like they'll have a great idea, but then it's that same idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and there, and there's a lot of new bands that I think are pushing it forward in really cool ways. You know, I was just having this conversation with my friend, like, uh, what, who's it, Blood Incantation? Uh, there's a couple other, uh, you know, interesting bands. Obviously, Gore Guts is not new, but they're always kind of doing something fresh and cool. Yep. And um, it was just cool to see a band that, like, Deathcore is not a genre I typically gravitate towards. So I was expecting that when I, when I put up this record, but I was, I was kind of pleasantly surprised by, it. Um, yeah, just just the dynamics and, and how the songs all have an arc. And I also really love the lead guitar playing. It, it's it's uh, kind of reminded me of at times of like Derek Taylor or Ryan Knight uh, or, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I've talked enough. Let's get Levi. Levi looks like he's, <laughs> he's, he's dying to talk here. Well, I, I, I love trying to tear me down here. I love the Derek Taylor face. reference. That's a deep cut. Um, <laughs> no, I, so Mike, you'll be surprised by this. Yeah, aside from like singers aside, um, obviously you're going to be into... Vocalist. Sorry, vocalist. Yeah, <laughs> fair, <laughs> the shouter. Um, obviously you're going to pick uh, vocalists that are hard to understand. It goes in line with your accent. Um, but I... <laughs> No, no. So of, of all of the records that you Let's guys... Let's keep picked, personal attacks out of this. <laughs> no, get them in here. Yeah. <laughs> we're all friends. <laughs> uh, of all the records that, that were picked that I had to listen to, this was actually my favorite. I actually really liked this album. Um, really? It was, yeah, musically, I, it, was, it was heavy. It was heavy as hell. Production's a big thing for me, and the production is good. Jason uh, Sickoff. Sounds great. Uh, the guitar playing when it's shreddy is shreddy enough, but never to the point where I go, is that legitimate? You know what I mean? We're going to mm-hmm. talk about, I won't mention who your other album is, <laughs> but that's definitely on the cusp of like, what's going, what's going on here. You know what I mean? Um, it just felt genuine. And I have an appreciation for that. Like the, the brutal death metal, obviously knowing you from playing the party can and stuff, it's all just very, very technically demanding stuff, but there's never, either a need or even a want to fake it like party can and a raw like i and i can't comprehend how you do the things that you do but you don't hide the fact that live or or even on a recording they might not be buried alive levels of of you know perfect and that to me is is cool and this record had that it wasn't messy it <coughs> sounded great um no, it sounded it, very human especially the drum production in particular yeah so yeah, I, I can't I can't really say a bad word about it other than the vocalist. Um, and <laughs> even then, I don't I don't hate vocalists that do that sort of thing. Like I listen to a lot of vocalists that do that, but I always tend to lean a little bit more to to someone that's like a, a singer. I mean, Mashuga are currently one of my favorite bands, and you don't you don't, you don't get much singing on those records. But nah, it, not a lot. it has to be appropriate. I, you couldn't just chop Zach Wild or Chris Cornell or whoever you, you like. Um, you mentioned Jeff Buckley earlier. You couldn't just cut Jeff Buckley out and put him in this setting and it worked. Like <laughs> it's an appropriate vocal for, yeah. for the music. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't really knock it for that. It's just, um, yeah, I, I'd listened to the record before because I, this, this was one of the records that we listened to on, on the guitar souls for the listening party, I'm sure. Um, uh, quite an early one, I believe. Yeah. So um, it was nice to hear it again because I did enjoy it. And I actually kind of kicked myself for not having listened to it since because this strikes me as a good, not that we can do it right now, but a nice gym album because it's heavy, um, it, it, but it's not background heavy is the way I would describe it. It doesn't just sort of sit in there. It grabs your attention. The, the it's also more <laughs> relentless. Yeah. I, 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 describe the, I describe this to my friends as, as the ice cream paradigm, right? Where when I have one bowl of ice cream, I'm like, man, life is good. Ice cream is great. When I have 10 bowls of ice cream, I'm doubled over the floor in pain. And I find that like uh, death metal records sometimes kind of have that effect where it's just, it's too much ice cream. It becomes not heavy after a while because of the sheer heaviness. When you have nothing to counteract the heaviness, you know, I, like I could find myself relaxing and falling asleep to a death metal album, which is the, the opposite effect it's supposed to have. But uh, when there's nothing to sort of counterbalance that heaviness, it's sort of just, it becomes the, you know, the ground level. There's no sort of, you know, nothing to compare it to. This record didn't have that, this record did not have that problem. So um, it had enough dynamics and enough variation to where I never felt like I was on bowl number 10. (laughs) That's good. The way I see it is like, and I think this is something that a lot of death metal and brutal death metal bands get and a lot that maybe don't or maybe do it by accident is that 
all art is about tension and then release. Mm -hmm. So you have the tension of the fast, f frenetic parts, brutal, whatever, and then the slow down to the release when everything just kind of slows down a bit and there's maybe like a very heavy beat to it. Like that's certainly how I see part of Canon. And uh, I think it's easy to get lost in playing fast and showing off without having context to make it good. Totally, totally, 100%. Um, so, Sonny, great record. Pleasantly surprised, but uh, thank you for, for recommending it to us, Mike. I'll talk about my first pick now, and I'm curious to see what you guys think. I tried to pick some real Dark Horse picks here. Oh, <laughs> you, know, you okay. did, yeah. Now, now <laughs> let me give you a, a, a small caveat uh, in terms of me and my relationship with metal. And I kind of draw a parallel between how I feel about movies, too, in that um, kind of relates to, to what you guys were saying previous. Uh, to this, but um, I will take practical effects over CGI any day. Oh, uh, yeah. There's something yep. human and something beautiful about someone having just the tools that they have and making something unique or interesting happen with that. Um, my taste in movies tends to gravitate towards that. Once it's a CGI fest, I can't get into it. Um, that same, same thing I could draw a line to my, my appreciation for metal is that I like metal that is not super produced right i like to hear the human elements i like to hear that it's not totally super super tight and super super gridded that it's that, that it's really people playing it um and uh that brings me to my first pick which was a psychotic waltz uh social grace so this is a weird record from 1989 um i think that these guys were just to my ears they were sort of ahead of the curve in curve in like um songcraft in metal and especially kind of somewhat technical metal i mean these guys even though the songs have like a real technical sort of uh bend to them uh they all have choruses they all have sort of um you know nice key changes that sort of create like an apex there's a definite apex to the tunes um and i also appreciate harmonically uh at least in terms of dual guitar harmonies how they really sort of think outside the box if you really take a listen to the solos uh, the harmonies are not your typical metal parallel harmony. I would say they're more akin to something like cacophony, where the harmonies are very kind of weird and unpredictable. Um, and I think that adds so much to the music. Uh, I know the singer is probably uh, divisive, but I've grown to really, really appreciate the vocals on this record just because the phrasing is so unique. He's like, kind of reminds me of Ian Anderson singing in a metal band or something like that. Um, <laughs> but I'm very curious to hear what you guys think about these picks, because I think this is you know, again, it's nostalgia because I've listened to this album for a long time. This is an album I discovered in a record store that I worked at when I was, when I was a kid, when I was probably 15. And That's I was amazing. just like, whoa, these guys are really doing something unique. I couldn't believe when this record came out. Um, so anyway, let, let, I'll bring the floor to you guys because I'm, I'm curious. I, uh, I actually listened to this for the first time uh, when I was sat in the hospital waiting to, for people to work out what the hell was going on. Um, with, with me and that was a strange time to listen to something like this because i was yeah. feeling um very confused in general and in pain and uh -huh. this added to that pain <laughs> uh, no i have to say um it was very artistic and mm. and i totally i can totally get why well two things i can totally get why why you didn't of all people would really love this record mm -hmm. um but also maybe why it didn't catch on uh, mm -hmm. as well because it's very it's pushing a lot of a lot of barriers a lot of boundaries um mm -hmm. i really the, so the, i made some notes when i was listening to it and the first thing that really jumped out to me was the definition between the left channel and right channel of the guitar it didn't yeah. feel like your typical uh, metal bands of the time that would just have these very tight parts that were, were identical in the left and right channels yeah. there was variation in there and that was just really cool it just constantly kept me sort of bouncing from side to side going oh that's really cool and where's it going to go with here and oh i like what's going on here so i yeah musically cool production for me is obviously i'm going to say a little bit raw um yeah. and the vocalist i didn't hate i didn't hate the vocalist there mm. were moments where i was like this is pretty cool and there were moments where um I also, if I recall, I looked into them and no, no recognition for the guitar player. I didn't recognize the name. Yeah. Um, and they haven't gone on to do anything else. Is that right? Yeah, they just recently got back together and released some new music, but um, it's definitely not the same. It's like, you know, one of those things when a band reunites years down the road, and they're trying to do a streamlined <laughs> version of what they think would be appropriate. Yeah. Um, it just didn't strike the same notes with me. I think what I love about this band is just how unique and weird they are. It was very theatrical, is the way I would describe it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I didn't want to just listen to it. I wanted to watch it. 
And I don't yeah. mean necessarily as mm -hmm. a performance. I meant I just I could imagine just really kooky, uh, almost B movie level film footage to go with it because it was just yeah very very fun um, would be yeah. my way to describe it. Yeah, and when I, you know when when I think about not to interrupt you, Mike. Sorry, steamrolling over here. But when I just think about this record coming out in 1989, and I also I was a big fan of this band, so I have their their demos. I have all this this cool stuff. Um, but these songs were written probably as early as 86, 85, 86. I mean, when you think about other other stuff that was happening around then, you know, these guys are from San Diego, so you're thinking the you know the thrash stuff that was going on in California at the time. Um, just I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at one of these early shows where these guys were playing this stuff because I really think that. You know, I almost hear like an influence in modern bands like Protest the Hero. You know, I could hear sort of a lot of where they're coming from in, in this. I haven't actually talked to Luke specifically about this band, but like there's, there's definitely some modern bands that I've heard where I'm like, oh, I get a little bit of this flavor that I get from Psychotic Waltz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, Mike. That makes total sense. Um, what it reminded me of a lot in the sense that it's clearly good but as you say, the vocalist, not to everybody's taste, but I think it's one of those voices that grows on you the more you get to know it because it's so unconventional. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Dead Heart and a Dead World by Oh, totally. Nevermore. Yeah, yeah, Nevermore, yeah, totally. So just that, not entirely the same, but that kind of similar vein that you could imagine, as Levi said, something going along with it that's like a visual representation of the music. Mm -hmm. And also kind of thought to myself, like if, if Ron Yarsenbeck kind of tailored it back a bit and did the music for a B-movie, that's probably where it would end up going. <laughs> Um, <laughs> interesting yeah yeah people lump them in with like watchtower i think when i hear people talk about them so that that uh yeah very apt comparison uh, <laughs> i have a question for you on them tom um so is this a band that because i'd never heard of them is this a band on on your scene uh out where you are and with the musicians that you know stateside is this a band that you hear people talking about um their first two records i think uh are pretty influential underground metal albums at, at least in my circle of friends i can't attest to uh outside of that but um yeah I, to me their first two records are just so unique and maybe their second record might even be a better record than this one but it takes a little it's a little darker and a little moodier um so, but I, I do think that in the scene they have credit, but just they, I, they never got the credit that they deserved, I think. I mean, they did a reunion mm -hmm. tour where they opened up, uh, this was maybe 2010, they opened up for Nevermore and Symphony X. That was their big reunion thing. And um, so, you know, there, there's an awareness of them. But I think um, for me, these, these first two records were just so unique and so cool. And, and they just, they had a lot of misfortune throughout their career. Like I was reading something where um, the guitar player was talking about how on, on the, t on the tour for this record. So one of the guitarists is in a wheelchair permanently. He's, he's, uh, so when they were getting ready to tour for this record, um, the other guitar player had a, had a mountain climbing accident and he was in a wheelchair also. So both <laughs> guitar players were in a wheelchair Jesus. and he got nerve damage that made it so that he could only grow a beard on half of his face. So like, they <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just like wild. Like you're thinking of like, you talk about bad luck, but, um, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it seems like they've had a lot of uh, misfortune. I think, at least from what I've read, on one of their music video shoots for one of their later albums, um, one of the actors was blinded because of a light or something like that, and they had a big lawsuit against them. That was sort of a big uh, kind of thing about may maybe a big part of why they broke up. Who knows if that's entirely true or not. But, you know, there's not that much information out there to go to on these guys. But I just always thought this was a really, really unique record, and a record that definitely didn't immediately click with me on the first listen but mm -hmm. once once you get under the hood and give it a couple of listens you really start hearing all that stuff you're talking about with like all the unique overdubs they put in the stereo field kind of sprinkled all over um you know and and the hooks in the songs uh sort of start to unveil themselves like the chorus of halo of thorns the second song man that is such a cool chorus i i, I mean that's what i was trying to cultivate when i came up with mr invisible you know is sort of that kind of chorus where it's totally disjointed but you have this seemingly kind of normal melody kind of floating floating on top of it and um you know i just think uh yeah the, i just think these guys were super unique and it's a record i try to recommend to people because it's you know if you guys didn't hear about it man probably most people haven't heard about it because you guys know more music than uh most people i know so it definitely <laughs> makes sense um you're talking about being a fan of like atheist and cynic 
because uh-huh. that's kind of where I placed that as well. It's maybe not quite towards the heavier side, but definitely the, the progressive element in the kind of songwriting. Yeah. Um, in terms of the cool? songwriting, like what, like, do you guys have any reference point? Like you think about 1989 and metal, what other guys were really writing songs like this that were sort of thrashy, proggy, but had a song structure and had a definite harmonic sort of element to it. Um, There's not that many. Maybe like Testament. Maybe Testament. Dark yeah. Angel, Death. See, I would say Dark They're Angel is still didn't have the harmonic element that these guys have. They, mm, there's I there's sort of a songwriting thing that is is very 60s almost in, in Psychotic Waltz's writing. Whereas I think Dark Angel still to me suffered from the like lots of riffs kind of disease, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I mean, I like like Time Doesn't Heal, for instance. I think that's a really cool album. But still, the vocal melodies never really gel. It still has that thrashy sort of like I'm speak singing to you kind of thing, which is cool. Mm-hmm. But it's different, I think, from what these guys are going for. Fair enough. The other album that it put in mind for me was Remedy Lane by Pain of Salvation. Okay, interesting. You heard this before? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that record. Yeah. That's a good record. <clears throat> and again, it was just the, the kind of really unique, really raw vocals. Mm-hmm. That like just a guy who can clearly sing in a room with a microphone, tiny bit of reverb, and just gets on with his job and does it well. That kind of put that in my mind. I know that Remedy Lane's like another 12 years later or something, 2002, mm-hmm. according to the internet. But that is, that's kind of, I got that in my mind when I was listening to it. Interesting. Um, I'm not going to lie, it's an album that I think I need to listen to a lot to get into. Yeah, but for sure. Not because it's bad, just because it's like, it reminds me of other bands that I've heard of that era that I kind of prefer their sound of because I'm more familiar. If sure. That makes sense. Sure, yeah. Um, but I did really enjoy it. I'm going to have to go back and give them a good listen. Um, your second choice resounded with me just ridiculous <laughs> but anyway we'll, we'll okay we'll, awesome we'll awesome. that later um, no I really enjoyed the uh, Psychotic Waltz as well actually it was, it was interesting to the yeah, point yeah. it's like even if you didn't like it the first listen you want to go back and give it a second which I think is very much a positive out the, yeah out the for, for, exactly yeah and I, and, I, and I picked it for a reason because I knew you guys would have some interesting things to say about it so <laughs> um, awesome so uh Let's move on to uh, our next pick here. And once again, just for the people listening, that was Psychotic Waltz, Social Grace. Now we're moving on to Levi's second pick. This is like really... <laughs> I just went with, my, with a gut feeling um, with this one. It's not even an old album. Um, I thought of some old albums, some, you know, like early Symphony X stuff or, or whatever. Yeah, I was surprised to, to, to see you pick an album from, what is this, 2017, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and to be honest, right... Honestly, this album is virtually just as new to me as it is to you. It was recommended to me by one of the listeners of our podcast, and I checked it out um, and have listened to it a fair few times since because I enjoyed the vocalist. Mm. Um, she's a she's a great singer. So this is um, the Sands of Time. I'm sure it's called by a band uh, named Scardust. Mm. Yeah, I think <laughs> <You're> <laughs> that's how little I know about them. <laughs> the Sands of Time. Yeah, so the, these guys are a band from Israel. Yeah. Yes. Um, which kind of, uh, I guess Israel has a bit of like an insular kind of music scene. Like I know they have tons of incredible jazz musicians in Israel too, that just, you know, by virtue of being all the way in Israel, maybe don't break it over to our audiences. So I'm assuming, you know, um, you know, these guys might be a bigger name over there, but yeah, I, I had never heard of them in my life. There's tiny, tiny community in Israel. <laughs> a really good death metal community in Israel. There's a, a, a death fest called Tel Aviv Death Fest. Yeah. At least there used to be. And there's a band called Viscera Trail from Tel Aviv. And uh, their tagline is the sickest band in the Holy Land. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's great. Gadget. Yeah. yeah, so if I had to give you my thoughts on this album, why I like it, uh, well, you know the answer. It's, it's the singer. I, she's mm. fantastic. Musically, it, the guitar playing is good, but I certainly not... I'm not going to go back to this album for the guitar playing, mm-hmm. um, but I will absolutely go back to this album time and time again, because I just really, really enjoy the, the singer. And that's again, just really important to me. And it's progressive. Um, you could tell that I was thinking symphony X prior to picking this because yes, it's, yeah, exactly. it's just got that vibe. I'm, yeah. I've always, uh, you know, metal wise, I definitely had a lot more progressive and power metal influences. Uh, it was, my, my youth was really thrash metal, uh, power metal and then progressive metal which yeah. then led into the jazz thing so um i have a soft spot for that that power vibe mm-hmm. and yeah <laughs> then I, are they singing about dungeons and dragons and shit like that 
Yeah, um, they do mention a crystal ball and a dragon within the first track. So yeah. ju just so you know what, what you're what you're in for. Yeah. But it has that kind of um, musically, it has that progressive quality of themes that feel like they're repeating. Uh, you can listen to the album and halfway through it feel like you're hearing something that you've heard before. And it's, of course, because you have. Um, so it just feels like a kind of well-crafted um, metal experience. And yeah, not a new band, tiny little band, 4,000 followers on Facebook. Uh, probably could have picked something, <laughs> something a little bit more from back in the day here. But as I say, I just had to go with what my heart told me. And that's an album that I've been listening to that I feel, uh, if we're talking about underrated metal bands, mm -hmm. By that, what that means to me is people, a band that more people should know about. Well, this is a band that currently exists, and I feel that more people should know about them. Yeah. So that seems like as good a reason as any to uh, to pick them. But uh, what do you think, Tom? Yeah, uh, well, definitely fits the bill as underrated. I thought it was really, really creative. The singer is definitely the highlight for me in terms of like, um, you know, she has this sort of Broadway kind of thing, but then she could also do this like gruff sort of thing. She had some screaming. I'm sure that I'm pro pretty sure that was still her doing the harsh vocals too. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it was really, really impressive. Uh, there was one particular track. Let me just pull up my track list here. Arrowhead that I, yep. I really enjoyed the vocal phrasing in that one. I just thought it was a really unique melody and the way they sort of dance around the melody. Um, I definitely got a Symphony X like five era sort of. Um, yeah vibe from this in terms of how it's orchestrated and, and the pacing of the album and and the riffing at times i mean my favorite thing about symphony x is michael romeo's rhythm guitar playing oh yeah I mean, it's just like he he's an absolute vicious animal like his no one really riffs like him he uh there were mo there, walking, <laughs> there were moments uh where i got that sort of thing the, du the dungeons and dragons kind of stuff um i have a little bit of a low threshold for that nowadays. I feel like if I heard it at the right time, if this album came out, you know, like when I was listening to Blind Guardian and stuff like that, I would be all over it. Um, I do think these guys have a leg up on a lot of the stuff in this sort of symphonic kind of power metal kind of zone in that harmonically, it's much richer. They're coming from a Broadway, or you mentioned Disney when you described them to me. Oh, yeah. Right? They're, the harmonic palette is more musical theater than it is metal. So it's not like we're... I would say something like Rhapsody or something like that, where it's just sort of your typical modal metal kind of thing. And, and, but these guys really have um, a harmonic depth to the music where you could tell they really thought about the harmonies, not as some sort of secondary thing, but really as like, a, you know, it gives it this theatrical kind of bend, which I think is the most attractive element of this band, because that's really kind of what separates it from other stuff. You know, there's moments that sound like other bands, but I think, they're at their strongest when they're really pushing that Broadway kind of thing forward. Yep. Um, and the guitar playing was great. Um, you know, very clean, neoclassical, kind of the typical licks that you would, you would hear in that vernacular. Um, generic, like for the style, generic, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was appropriate. There was moments where like uh, in this style, you know, where the guitar player will just start sweeping the chord progression underneath where, yeah. where I, was, I kept on thinking to myself, okay, we don't really need that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But that, yeah, I know, whatever, that's, that's an aesthetic criticism. That's not like a, you know, that's to each his own kind of thing. But well, uh, not, not every band can have a Michael Romeo in, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I find that with a lot of progressive uh, symphonic metal bands, the guitar players are the kids that grew up listening to well, Malmsteen, Jason Becker and the likes. And then they mm -hmm. take that all on board and go, right now I'm going to do this all on my own music and see what comes out. And it feels very calculated. Um, mm -hmm. And that... It's, I don't mean it as a negative thing because it just means that you fit the bill. Um, yeah, you yeah, do yeah. the, you, you, uh, you serve the purpose that you're supposed to in the band. But again, not every band can have a Michael Romeo. Who's just like a little bit next level when it comes to his creative. Yeah. I, I thought what I, what I will say gave this a leg up was the use of real strings, which is something on like those classic symphony X records that uh, sometimes I find myself like, <laughs> oh, I wish this was real strings, but I understand the budget constraints of stuff. And listen, I'm from New Jersey, so I grew up with Symphony X. You know, they're like local heroes. Um, another New Jersey record in this rotation here. Look at that, right? Zach Wild and uh, this one, uh, Symphony X. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I enjoyed it. Is it something I would come back to? Uh, there's maybe one or two tunes where I'm like, ooh, I want to listen to that and just check out that chord progression in there, you know, one or two times. There was some, some interesting stuff. Um, 
like I said, if I heard it at the right time, I would feel different about it. Right now, the Dungeons and Dragons thing to me, yeah. unless it was an album that I heard when I was a kid, when I was into that stuff, it doesn't strike the same chord with me. But I mean, I appreciate the musicianship and I feel like, um, yeah, I really appreciate the musical theater element of it yeah. uh, in, in, in terms of uh, that aspect of the sound I loved. It was just, just made it more fun you know, yeah. than most albums of this genre. <laughs> For me, the, uh, one of the measuring sticks for what I'm going to listen to a lot of is uh, will I be able to put this on when I'm cooking with my wife and mm-hmm. her not complain about it? You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, I think her, that, that's any, any married man or man in a yeah. relationship are always <laughs> straddling that line. Yeah, she doesn't want to hear any of the jazz nonsense. She doesn't want to hear any shouty vocals. Um, she doesn't want to hear things where there's too much musical like uh, proficiency, where there's any real showing off. And this is one that I've had on many times in the kitchen, and uh, I've caught her, her singing along to some of the choruses. And I'm like, oh, you, you, know, you know this one, do you? She's like, yeah, I quite like this one. And yes, yeah, to me, that, that would be a good selling point for this album. If you want to put on an, on an album that you could potentially jo- enjoy with someone else that maybe doesn't like a lot of the music you listen to, uh, this one might be, might be a way in for them. Yeah, and, and as a side note, I will say real quick before uh, Mike jumps in on this one, um, I really love the moments of sort of really dissonant kind of parallel harmony that they'll throw in. Like, I believe it, uh, right after there's an overture in the beginning, but the first, I think it was the first tune, let me pull up the track list. It might have been Eyes of Agony, where they had this really nice dissonant moment between the guitar and keyboards, like a second apart, playing these parallel yeah. lines. And, like, that's stuff that, like, I would say most power metal bands don't venture into that sort of territory. And uh, I appreciate it. They, they take risks within the framework, it, it, within, like, a well-trodden framework, you know? Yeah. Mr. Mike. really good. Hello, hello. Um... <laughs> It's funny Levi mentions like measuring sticks because I I listen to a lot of absolute shit as well as music that I think I really enjoy, just depending on what my measuring stick is. But for music like this, it's kind of the same lines as Levi. It's the production overall. Um, and as you were saying yourself, like that kind of harmonic richness, that content of interest and chord progressions, things that you didn't expect that, that make sense, but you wouldn't have thought of right away. They're not the conventional whatever mm-hmm. um i have no musical theory so i'm gonna to have to try and layman's turn my way through this but you get what i mean like yeah totally when you hear a chord progression you know what the next chord's going to be but it isn't that and you go wait a minute and it catches you um and this kind of reminded me again of that, that that never more good for doing that um and it kind of put me in mind of scar symmetry as well i think with the kind of songwriting um and a lot of the kind of show and play between the keyboard and the guitar mm-hmm. And the vocals are ridiculous, man. Like, whatever her name is, the, the singer. Um, she reminds me a lot of Christian Elverstam, who was the singer for Scar Symmetry for the first three albums, I believe. In the sense that both of them can do a bit of everything very well. And probably more. They've just mm-hmm. not shown off yet. Yeah. Because it was Levi was letting me hear this album for the first time when we were fixing his PC. For the first time of however many. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, it was really interesting because he was like, just listen to this and like give it a try. I'm really into it, especially the vocals. There's some ridiculous bits. And I'm just kind of waiting. And then they, they came in and it, like, the, the, there's a really high falsetto note at the end of one of the songs. I think that's maybe Sands of Time, Act 5. I might be wrong. But she just hits that note right at the end and there's nothing else behind it. And it's like, Christ almighty, where did where, that come from? Especially, in, and the, the growl vocals as well. Um, the same as what you guys were saying as well regarding the guitars like it does get a bit wanky with just let's do a sweet tap and then one after it and doesn't really progress any melody but it's also not just everywhere it's it's a bit more than it needs to be but it's not the worst mm-hmm. um i think i would probably go back and listen to that again but i also wouldn't take it over Arch, uh, not Arch Enemy, sorry, Scar Symmetry, who I kind of see is similar. But I totally get why Levi picked it, because it's incredibly interesting. Um, and it's funny you mentioned theatrical as well, because that's exactly what fits that, almost in line with the uh, Psychotic Waltz. That same kind of, not Amdram, because that makes it sound really disrespectful, like, <laughs> like it's not crafted, <laughs> but theatrical, like the, 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 there is a certain kind of swagger to it where it's almost like this is an art form as well as just writing music there's yeah i I don't know how to describe it like a 
there's like a character comes through the music and you can feel the character's bravado. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, I, as with most music, which you'll find interesting when we talk about your next song, Tom, I usually switch off to lyrical content unless it's something really profound that catches me or it's some really weird that catches me off guard. Mm -hmm. So for this to be like, as I was expecting with anything that's going to go along with symphonic or power metal, it's going to be Heart of Storm and Swords <laughs> and yeah, folklore. Yeah. And I don't even, I don't like Dungeons and Dragons. I've never seen uh, any films ever at all. No, I'm trying <laughs> to think of um, Lord of the Rings. Never seen any Lord of the Rings films. Ah. I just, that, that, I've never played Skyrim. These mm -hmm. that that kind of genre of time, medieval, etc., doesn't do much for me. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to switch off. But what I found in that is that I really enjoyed the vocals more for just following the melodies and trying to piece out where the vocals were going. Sure. Rather yeah. than it being like the switching right into what was being said as well as what's going on. So that's yeah, kind of how I felt about it. I completely agree with you in that. I'm I'm exactly the same. When Tom uh, referenced crystal balls and i'm sure you said dragons in, yeah, in the yeah. first song yeah. um if you put a gun to my head and said levi do they reference dragons on this album yes or no i wouldn't be able to give you a solid answer because <laughs> yeah i'm i don't like that vibe either i constantly mm. for somebody that listens to well certainly listened to a lot of power metal um i hate the lyrical themes that you get in power metal it just mm. is so ludicrous and ridiculous to me um so <laughs> but i could just put that totally aside with this album because i was just listening to uh, an extremely talented singer doing her thing and it feels like at times you know if you said actually there's three different vocalists on this album i'd go i knew it i knew it <laughs> to totally yeah 100 percent. it's 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 amazing when you listen to the whole record how much ground she covers on this yeah um and uh yeah i mean i think it's a great record fans of symphony x fans of maybe even uh dream theater and you know mm -hmm. a certain era of dream theater would appreciate this um blind guardian and anything of that ilk um but just if if you want to you know hear a great vocalist just rip it up for an hour i mean it's a it's a great it's a great record in that regard and the arrangements are really cool i mean with power metal you kind of know what you're getting into I don't even know if you would classify this as strict power metal, but you know what I mean. There's, it's, yeah. it's a blueprint. But these guys subvert expectations enough times to make it a pretty interesting record in that genre. When there's probably, you think about all the power metal records that get released in a year, mm. um, that probably sound, you know, exactly like, you know. And I guess that goes for any subgenre kind of thing. But um, I appreciate these guys for having a unique spin on it, you know. And it mm. was definitely a band that I had never heard of, so very yes. yes good 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 dark horse pick i enjoyed it it was fun definitely um, definite. michael are you up next or nance hi i changed my name already man come on leave me alone um yes i'm next and my second choice was way more melodic and softer obviously not um it was planetary duality which is the second album by the faceless mm -hmm. A band whose who's reputation precedes themselves, I, I would say. These days, 100%. Mm -hmm. Now, the backstory to this is, I remember Kieran got me into the Faceless, actually. Mm -hmm. Props to Kieran. Um, and it was a Keldema, the first album, when that came out and listening through that. And it was, I really liked the production because it was quite mechanical, but mm -hmm. it suited the music, like almost like HM2, super saturated, high gain, fuzzy guitars, super, super punchy drums because they were clearly edited to death and sampled over <laughs> ridiculous vocals yeah. um fairly weird harmonic content in the sense that it was like death metal with slight jazz influence and just weird phrasings that you wouldn't really get a lot of the time in death metal and, mm -hmm. and heavy heavy songs so then planetary duality came out which is the second album and from the the first moment on that album with that big bass sweep i was just like what is going on man i'm oh, sorry it's not it's got the, the weird symbol shine in i'm thinking the second song mm. um and it's just relentless tech with loads of interest and strange patterns going on throughout it great guitar playing i know you're going to say levi but there is great guitar playing on it as well as oh, no, there incredibly is. edited yeah. guitar playing. Yeah. um and i think the reason i think this is underrated is i think this is when the band peaked in my mind because the third album auto theist is good but it's way more produced and it's 
heavily plagiarized and i mean heavily there's a riff in it that is actually just blackened by metallica there's another riff in it that is literally devon townsend and i mean like you know how devon does the, the weird sweeps and sings over it mm -hmm. michael keen's basically just taken a piece of a, like a devon song and just put it in this track and so many other bits of not so much a nod or a homage but blatant theft um in my opinion so you're still doing that um, yeah not a lawyer <laughs> exactly and then everything started to happen with michael keen falling ill the rumors about him canceling shows band members quitting constant changes whatever else that were kind of going on in the second album but this album just sticks out to me as just a really well written death metal album it, it kind of took the progressive side for me or the progressive bands i'd listened to before of like <clears throat> maybe not heavily progressive but um death and cynic mm -hmm. and down that route and just had this unique sound mm -hmm. and i wasn't necessarily bothered about the uh the alien theme that kind of thing but i was like well yeah it's based on some david ike writing uh, pretty much it wouldn't surprise me w no it is i, I pulled up For the real? wikipedia yeah because i uh <laughs> i was curious about the the lyrical content because you know the little you know you you catch little things of the lyrics you can understand i want to go back and read it and yeah it's based on uh, the Children of the Matrix by David Icke, and if if <laughs> if, if any if anybody wants uh, to be entertained for about six hours, um, there's a fucking hilarious. David Icke does these speeches, um, and they're on Amazon Prime where he 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 talks about his conspiracy theories and aliens and lizard people. But the funniest part of it is not to digress from this album, but. Uh, the funniest part, he has his son's band. They play like in between his rants and they kind of sound like the Goo Goo Dolls. They do this like generic kind of like melodic rock. And then he starts talking about lizard people. It is the most bizarre shit you will ever see. So on Amazon Prime, highly recommended. But yeah, that, that was a, a unique twist when I found out that was, this was, you know, kind of it's based on the work of David Icke. <laughs> I, I did not know that. So that's a, that's a great uh, context to it. Yeah. There's some fantastic videos. Um, from that era of the faceless playing live one specifically of lyle cooper the drummer for this album mm. um just being ridiculous live like just in his own zone really well shot the audio is good the drums are super prevalent but you can still hear everything else pretty mm. much um and it's just the intensity and it. it's just like for me like wow like i really really enjoy it and i think a lot of the it's like a playful metal album if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um coldly calculated design the intro riff to that I, I don't want to say it's like ron yarzenbeck but it's got that kind of silly feel but still like take it serious if you know what i mean mm -hmm. and still really playing serious riffs um but it's quite nostalgic for me just because i think it's when i think of this album i'm like why did the rest know just be better and better and better and everything mm -hmm. happened the way it did yeah. and i don't mean that as in like i've written the band off it could be that Michael gets all the help he needs and things get back to, to where they should be. You know, these other members want to join and they work on some really good stuff. But the last album they brought out, In Becoming a Ghost, just didn't really do anything for me at all. Mm. It was just like such a wild departure from where I kind of saw you were going in my mind. Which is a bit of a shame, but still at the same time, I really enjoy it. It's an album that if I put on, I'll listen to every track. Mm. So, so my interpretation of this record, this is the first stuff I've heard from The Faceless. Um, yep. I've obviously heard stories about Michael Keane. I feel bad. That has to be a hard thing to go through in the public eye. And it seems like they've, they've gone through an incredible amount of band members. And uh, yes. my first experience with The Faceless was seeing some video that someone shared of him just uh, high out of his mind playing live. Try, you know, was and he playing just, like a weird telecaster? Yeah, yeah, and just like that was a Bay Area Death Fest. Of yeah, friends who booked that and they were super disappointed. Yeah, it was it was rough. It was rough to see. Um, now, so my reference point for this album, I hear like the later Death influence. I hear Cynic. Um, I also get a Voivod sort of influence in terms of like the sci-fi kind of like Dimension Dimension Hatros era Voivod kind of weird dystopian sort of thing with like. It's like the this the weird computerized vocals are almost like cynic, but like pushed a step further. Um, yep. So it's got this cyber metal kind of thing. I, I would describe it as if if I, I had to you. call it something. Um, it's a uh, it's a record that I would call maximalist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, in that in that 
it seems to be um, the impression that I got from listening to it. It was almost like every song was an overture. You know what I mean? And I was, then I was waiting for the album to come and expand upon those ideas that I just heard. And it never really happened. There, there, was, so, there was so many moments that I really, really liked um, that I just wish they sort of like um, fleshed out. Like, oh, let, let's like develop this idea. Um, but it's just like a flash in the pan and it's gone. Um, for instance, just case in point, probably my favorite groove on this record was in Hideous Revelation. That riff is just so nasty. So it's like the intro, uh, part one of uh, Planetary Duality. It's like short. Mm -hmm. It's like a minute. It's like an introduction to the, you know, what the meat and potatoes of the tune. But yep. that riff, oh my God, I was like, oh, hell yeah. They're grooving on it for a little bit. And they groove on it for a minute. And it's like my favorite part of the entire record. It's probably the simplest part of the entire record. <laughs> but just because it's such a departure from the rest, it, it, that really stood out to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Xeno Christ was a really, really cool song that had like some nice um, sort of hooks. By and large, my, my issue with this album was that if you took one of the songs, right, if you put it into a bag and shook it around and then just poured it on the ground and reassembled it, the song would have the same effect because it doesn't, <laughs> to me, the, the, where yeah. the parts are don't really matter. They're mm -hmm. cool parts. They're really, really cool parts, really creative parts, but they just never gel for me as a statement. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying as well. I think it's, yeah. it's not so much a flowing record as it is like an emporium of ridiculous riffs. Exactly. To put it together. Yeah, it's like these are all the sick riffs that I, that I wrote in this period of time, and I'm just going to shove them together. And, right. and, there, and that doesn't mean there aren't great moments. There's a, there's a bunch of great moments. I feel like maybe in terms of dynamics, it was a little monochromatic. Like it's either... Um, like a clean guitar thing or like there's a little oompa keyboard part in one tune other than that it's just riffing just flying non-stop um so not to say it wasn't fun it was a fun record it's short you know it's easy to listen to i listen to it a bunch of times and it's like yep. it keeps the the keeps the momentum it doesn't overstay its welcome um in terms of the production i just feel like this I, I call it the Sumerian record style production, right? Where it's exactly it, what that is. You're right. <laughs> yeah, where it's where it's very very edited. It's almost like, yeah, it's almost like when uh, a criminal goes out on the lam and they burn their fingerprints off, right? So so no one can recognize them. I feel like that's the music equivalent of of this. You're taking away all the stuff that makes it sort of human and makes you you, uh, just to sound what ends up sounding like just kind of midi, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, even though. I'm sure it's not. There's, there, there's some great, uh, really surprisingly great guitar solo moments uh, on this record and stuff that didn't really sound edited to my ears. They just sound, you know, cool phrasing, nice ideas. Um, you know, especially in the drums. I'm such a stickler for just natural sounding drums. The drums just hurt my soul. That Sumerian uh, over the back, isn't it? Yeah, that yeah. That, that, when I think of Sumerian records, that's what I think of. That just like, where the drums are just so gritted, like, they might as well not have had anybody play them. You know, they might have. <laughs> I said, do you want me to play a click? No, there's no point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but creative. You can't say it's not creative. There's, there's uh, so many really, really cool moments in it. And if my complaint mm -hmm. is that, man, I'd love to hear those moments fleshed out. I mean, that speaks in a positive light of the record, I guess, in certain respects, because yeah. there were parts that I liked that I just like, man, if they developed that idea there, that section into a tune, woo, be, it would be fucking killer. Your point of view with rose tinted glasses on is my point of view. Like, listen, the potential in this record. Uh huh. You, you know what I mean? Like, totally. What, yeah. What totally. could have been? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and you know, it's a good record. It's quick. It's fast. It hits you. There's there's riffs that stuck with me, at, like like you know the little highlights that I mentioned. Um, but that would be my main gripe with just. And this isn't like, I'm not vindicating this type of music. It's just like I'm probably too old to have had this hit me at the right time where I was like, yes. You know, um, yeah. but uh, Levi, what do you think? Okay. Texture, you're right. Sorry, so, you um, I like, I, so I can kind of defend them when it comes to the, uh, the kind of lack of um, development to the, to the songs. Because to me, this whole sci-fi inspired thing, and it's fitting that I'm having this conversation with, with Tom of all people, another man that, ha that has a music video where uh, members of his band are uh, pulled apart by aliens and Sal takes an anal probe. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, this, you know this theme all too well. Um, to me, bands that have that vibe 
it, it's nowhere near as widespread as it could be and i think a huge part of getting it is is the the feel of it and just putting you into just that it, you're right it is one uh emotion if you like that they that they're going for is uh creating a soundscape if you like and it, it has that that kind of cynic esque from time to time uh vocal uh vocal thing the electronic vocal thing it just puts you in that in that sci-fi world so to me i don't mind so much that there's not the same level of song development because to me it's non-traditional songs it's i was thinking while you we guys were talking about that like we were making fun of the power metal themes but imagine a power metal band coming along and deciding right we're going to do the power metal music but all of our lyrical themes are going to be sci-fi we're going to do like really wacky out there sci-fi stuff like that's i don't even know if that would work but this works so well um for being that and of course, I think people are going to, and Mike included, going to expect me to rip into this for like editing and stuff like that. But mm. I don't ever take issue with it musically. I take no issue with it artistically when bands go to whatever levels they need to create the, um, the aesthetic, the musical aesthetic that they're going for. Um, I can't really take that away from them. I don't personally like the ridiculously over-the-top edited drums. But when you're going for that over-the-top, you know, sci-fi futuristic scary space sound mm -hmm. you need to have a sound that is just completely robotic and unnatural and that's just the way the way that is so yeah. i don't really take any any issue with that uh obviously it felt a lot more tweaked than the the previous record um that we that mike put forward uh sunny uh, sunny yeah yeah sunny, um, yep. it's it, funny you lot... mentioned the production on this sorry i interrupt you um, oh, okay. as far as i know the they had a lot of problems with the production like i think uh, michael keen had problems with his systems and his computer went down and they couldn't get the tracks for the studios and whatever reason they mixed it themselves and i think michael did like a 60 hour session stay, trying to stay awake mixing it before it had to be like deadline so i don't think they were very happy with the mix of it either so it could have been better and i think even they know that but I, again that might just be michael keen musing yeah and then fact, you know what i mean that and that's a shame, right? Because obviously I've listened to this. We've made fun of or poked fun at Michael Keane a lot on the Guitar Souls because of the way he treats people and the way he treats his fans. And when you tell a story like that, like I half buy it because it's like, yeah, I can imagine Michael Keane staying up for 60 hours and I know, I know how he'd probably go about doing that, you know? Um, that kind of taints a record like this for me because it's hard for me to really fall in love with something where I know at the very core of it is somebody that I have very negative uh, emotions towards and the very negative feelings towards mm -hmm. because of the way he, he treats other people. But artistically, I don't hate stuff like this. Uh, one of my most popular videos is me. It's not just Lucas Mann, but there's this, a section of it where I'm ripping into Lucas Mann. And I don't hate Rings of Saturn at all. Um, I I like their, the thing that they do. And uh, this is that same vibe to me. It's that just trying to create something artistically that is so far removed from what came before trying to get in that spaceship and just take it somewhere completely different and yeah this album it, it achieves that for me it's you know it's different and um maybe it isn't maybe this is a massively pop popular subgenre of metal that everybody listens to but it's totally different for me would be my way of putting it um and yeah don't don't hate it uh guitar playing's a little bit ridiculous in in places but not not even in a in a uh hatred way just more like that's not to my taste i think mm -hmm. i <laughs> my example for this is um i think there's a speed limit that you can achieve on the guitar and when you go beyond that speed limit the only way you can push past that speed limit is to remove dynamic variants from your playing and the person that kind of highlights that speed limit for me is paul gilbert when you listen to paul gilbert play there's so much dynamic variants he can accent and there's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like he's not playing so fast that he can't still hit those strings like a motherfucker if he wants to yeah he's like um, a rudimental drummer when he does that that yeah. speed where he has that still control to to make it a musical phrase by virtue yeah. of what he's accenting in and i feel with stuff like this you when you have these long runs it's not it's <laughs> it's played the way it is um because there's no other way to play it. You know what I mean? The, the, it's designed to be inhuman. The, the most perfect way that an album like this could be put together is using not real guitars, because that's the literally the sound you're going for. You are going out of your way to sound as much like Guitar Pro as humanly possible. So you can totally understand why some, some bands might opt for using that.
stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't know like what, where the super gated, super edited, I guess the first band that I heard like that was probably Necrophages, like to a degree where it really stood out as like, um, okay, so this is a new a- <laughs> aesthetic kind of uh, choice for metal. I mean, um, but this record, uh, hold on, I have the notes. When did this thing come out? 2012? 2008. 2008, okay. Yeah. So that might have been, you know, they're probably one of the earlier bands to sort of adapt that sort of sound, no? I, w- I would imagine. Uh, in terms of the production? Of Sorry, yeah, I think a big part of that would be, just as you mentioned before, Sumerian. I think that's a big key element to that. Everybody sounding like they're going through a Line 6 pod, and they've mm. got it sounding good, but really, really digital. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you, you can get away with it if you weren't having so much gain, but y- you know that's like the rectal setting on one of those red bean pods on someone's <laughs> desk. Like, it definitely... <laughs> And that, uh, you know, can I get a noise gate between my guitar and my amp? Can I get a noise gate between my power, uh, my preamp and my power amp? Can I get a noise gate between my amp and my speaker? Can can somebody insert a noise gate between my pickup and the cable? That would be fantastic, please. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe would... you could have Elon Musk install one in your in your brain. Uh, you know, like a, <laughs> a a neural noise gate. Yeah, it'd be more effective to just maybe gate the speakers. Just for me, <laughs> gate it so they're just constantly off. That would be wonderful, please. Um, nice and peace and quiet. I, and I feel like a curmudgeon with my complaints. My complaints are more just like aesthetic sort of, uh, you know, I know it sounds like it's like, you know, get off my lawn type old guy complaining Not kind cool. of thing. Um, but I understand the aesthetic and it, and it definitely serves the purpose of this weird sci-fi dystopian kind of, kind of thing that they're going for. Um, my gripe is just in, in terms of how the songs hit as a whole on the, on the macro level, not so much the micro level. That, Which is totally fair. Yeah. Um, but it was fun. There, there was definitely a couple certified bangers on here, and it was not a record that I would have listened to uh, of my own volition. So I appreciate it. Uh, you might like the first album more. It's a bit yeah. less frenetic and disjointed. A bit more songwriting in it. You, you said like fuzzy HM2 kind of guitar tones. Is it like that Swedish old school kind of sound more so? Um, the first album, no, but it's like a lot. T- take the production in this album and wind it back a bit, but with the same kind of really super gainy guitar tone. Cool. It's, yeah. It's not, it's not really go. HM2, but you know what I mean? Like rather than it being super defined, really well tightened, gent style guitars, it's, it's big, thick, lots of gain, EMGs, 25 noise gates, three boosts, mm-hmm. an amp on the red channel dying. To, you, know, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it's, it's, yeah. V30 IR, clearly meant to be an SM57, right against the cone, fuzzy, lots of high end. I definitely would have uh, gone and checked this band out live until recently. You know, after hearing this, when this record came out, I would, uh, if I had heard it at the time, I would have loved to have gone to see what this was all about live. Same. Yeah, for Never sure. I mean, I, that definitely, I would love to see, you know, how they, how they pulled it off live. I mean, it, it's, uh, like I said, definitely creative, not necessarily my cup of tea, but some great moments on there and that was the faceless planetary duality mike's pick um oh my god is it me now speaking of not my cup of tea yeah so (laughs) i fully anticipated uh this record to be hated by levi but i thought it would make great fodder for conversation my my last pick was from a band called thought industry uh the record is called mods carve the pig assassins toads and god's flesh um so this was a record that was on a big label it was on metal blade records Came out in 91, 92, something like that. Kind of, kind of flew, flew under the radar as far as I'm concerned. And I just think they had such a unique sound in terms of using the fretless guitar against the fretted guitar and, and uh, their, their weird kind of cut up lyrical content. Um, they had sort of like a, on this album, I guess it has kind of like a, almost like a hardcore punk kind of urgency, but still yeah. like some, some uh, pretty cool musicianship like underneath the surface of these, these really weird tunes. So uh, let let's just start off because Levi looks like he's 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 ready to pounce on this one. So let's let's, let's start with that. <laughs> I'm just staring relentlessly at the album artwork um, because I every time I put this on and tried to get into it, I just find myself staring at that artwork and trying to work out what the hell it is. That's a uh, Salvador Dali painting. Uh, okay, it looks to me like a man in a suit, um, a pope suit that's half turned into a giant white penis. That's what I see when I look at it. it yeah, um, and- very strange. Um, and that is a great summary of the music. It's um, as a genre, like, or, or in terms of influences, like I hear the punk thing. There's definitely that, that punky, um, the vocal delivery is very raw. Um, 
he, we mentioned theatrical earlier, and this is super, super theatrical to me. Uh, I don't really know how to s- describe it. Avant-garde is not quite the right word, but it's like, um, it's kooky for the sake of being kooky. Like they're, they're steering into it. They're, they're trying to go out there and just do something like. Finally, you know, it pop punk mini opera about a guy having a conversation with jesus in a bar um so this is the kind of weird shit that you're in for on this album but uh, continue yeah and it's um i don't know if i can really think of any bands that sound like this the only one that jumped into my mind and this is um this is a deep cut is the band pinkly smooth which was uh, one of Mike's favorite guitar players, uh, Sinister Gates band before he was in Avenged Sevenfold, yeah. um, where they were they they were going for this kind of really over the top progressive punk jazz sound, um, and yeah, I mean you should you should check that out, Tom, because I think you'll see what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I've never, um, never heard of it. Check but it. if I were to try and pick other bands that sound like this, it's just so far removed from anything that that I've really spent any time listening to so yeah uh i just don't really know what to make of it every time i've sat and tried to listen to this i've just found myself confused um which is a totally valid thing like i i I don't mean that in a negative way i think uh the worst thing that could possibly happen is making a piece of art making an album putting it out there for people to listen to and then putting it on and just going yeah, indifference is the worst reaction you yeah. can get to art, for sure. Yes. And totally just the fact challenged. that you were confused and not indifferent makes me happy because that yeah. means that there's something, there's something in this record. There's something unique. Like you said, you can't quite pinpoint the exact influences. There's moments that sound like, you know, maybe something familiar. But as a whole, as a statement, there's not really a reference. Yet I can think of references that came after the fact. You know, like when I hear the first tune, Horse Powered, immediately I think of Dillinger Escape Plan. That sounds like that could have been on Miss Machine you know, which didn't come out till 15 years after this record came out. <laughs> I, I think it would have definitely fit on Irony is a Dead Scene. I think the vocalist sounds so much like Mike Patton and style and delivery and madness. Like mm-hmm. just that, that and we'll he's playing bass at the same going. time, which is, it impresses me. I, I, insane. Yeah. Insane. Uh, yeah, that's under there, sorry. I, unlike um, my last pick, Sands of Time, like I, I, I like that album, I do, and I'm going to listen to that album again. And there will probably come a time in the next year or so where that album falls off my radar. I won't think of it ever again. And who knows, maybe five years from now, it will pop into my mind and I'll listen to it. Um, but there's not a need to listen to that album. Whereas with this, although it's not something that I crave, mm-hmm. I could absolutely put it on at any time and ch- challenge myself with it because I can, I can think about it as I'm listening to it and really try and digest what's going on. You are definitely going to hear a new thing every time you listen to this yeah it's just so unbelievably out there mm-hmm. um you're ma- <laughs> you mentioned like uh Dillinger escape plan that's not a band again that i've just not really listened to so i know that this is definitely um a thing that uh, has its line of influences and has then gone on to influence other things but it's just so removed from my understanding of, of music it's kind of like if uh, if i sat my grand down and played her a party cannon album mm-hmm. you know it's just like she she would have no musical reference for for what it is you have to walk someone up to that so to just drop me in with this was just like whoa what is going on here i'm yeah. just going to say hot take by the way that i'm quite disappointed neither of you picked party cannon <laughs> just putting out there I thought, um, would would I be judged if I picked my own album? <laughs> yes, heavily. But we know you well enough. So it's yeah, Mike right. would well, never let you live that one down. Then. I wanted to get, I wanted to get, you know, at least two listens to it this year. You know, that would have been that, <laughs> two more streams. Well, least. you know what? I'll, I'm going to link both of you, uh, your guys' music to this video, so you'll you'll get tens of listens. You know? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Mike, what what, what did you think of this one, Mike? I fucking loved it. Is the, the quick way to summarise it, and I'll, I'll go into it in depth. So when it first started, I was like, this is dissonant madness. It's like grind, but it's not quite just focused on like 260 BPM blasts and whatever else. And it's like, I really liked the production. I thought the drums sounded great. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there was a real feel to them. Like you could feel somebody playing the songs, not like yeah. my last choice which it, mm-hmm. you honestly could imagine somebody at a desk just playing my midi keyboard mm-hmm. and plugging it in fucking note by note on a grid um the vocals really caught my attention and all i could think about when i was listening to it was mr bungle mm. california you mentioned dillard's escape plan irony's a dead scene 
Um, to go back to a band that's already been mentioned again, Soundgarden. It's very almost Seattle grunge feel, like really Californian, like kind of yeah. all the time, if you know what mm-hmm. I mean, even yeah. in the production and stuff as well. Um, <clears throat> I thought the more I listened to it, the less I understood the album, but in a good way, because like mm-hmm. nothing makes sense, but that's always a good thing. Again, going back to what I was saying earlier on, like when you're guessing something, when you don't get music and you want to go back and listen, you get something new from it. I yeah. think that is a really good trait to bring you back and give it a couple more listens and let it win you over. And I had this one um, quite a few times just in the house, even if I, did, I wasn't bothered about putting music on, I would just put that on and like you find yourself singing along to like uh, Jane Whitfield is dead. Like Yeah, Jane Whitfield is standing That's out. a great song. Like, yeah. And then all the songs come on and I'm like, this is fucking crazy. What's it called? I'll smirk the God Blender. Right, mm-hmm. okay then. And I message you specifically saying, man, like the lyrical content in this is just... It's like watching a David Lynch film. It's just nonsense, but it's so captivating. Like you're yeah. like, I know I can work this out. It's it's like overly familiar, but mm-hmm. you can't quite make it out. Have yeah. you saw those photos they've put on? You get them on Facebook, and I think it's like an AI creates them, mm-hmm. and it's to simulate what a stroke feels like. Where there's like lots of really like really really um recognizable things in the photo, but everything you look at it, you're distracted by another one, and nothing makes any sense. If you haven't seen those images, that's a terrible way to describe it but i like where was, you're going with with that though i know what you mean <laughs> no, I'm talking about like the, yeah. the more it was like disjointed nonsense there would be bits come in that made sense like jane whitfield is dead and i'd be like oh there's context there it's like is this a guy talking about or like a stream of consciousness where maybe his brain's not working right and then obviously salvador dali uh, the album mm-hmm. art, and i'm like is this just like a play on salvador dali's complete train of nonsense like bits and like pictures that look and make sense and then just avant-garde nonsense um but it all fit really well and I, what struck me the most is the more i was listening the more i'm like they were really clever with a lot of instruments when you're talking about the two guitars against each other um and the usage of fretless guitar which is not you know definitely not nope. common you know no definitely not man you're like the only other person i know apart from levi who got his for you mm-hmm. um that, that does it and does yeah. it well and does it often or <clears throat> at least has like it recorded on the albums and stuff mm-hmm. um and even like we daft bits where there was um i want to say it was either data cookbook or gelatin where the chorus comes in and there's like a harmonica and it's got lots of reverb and phase over the top oh yeah that's that's actually fretless guitar oh is it yeah because in my mind i was like that that's the, like the a bam, mouth bam, the that, that line yeah it's just uh, it's really clever it's really good it has you guessing even like some of the instruments you're like clearly like is that this is that that um and a lot of really catchy bits and hooks michigan jesus is the one with the drum intro isn't it yeah uh-huh and it's, it's kind of like bad religion ish i would say I, it reminded me of propaganda okay or propaganda so like yeah, bad totally. religion as well like that that yeah. total real total raw punk it's cool mm-hmm. as shit really really enjoyed it and i'm going to probably continue to listen to it quite a lot and I know Nancy will hate me when I've got it on because there'll be bits in it that don't make any sense. <laughs> oh yeah, like the, the the instrumental closer to build a better bulldozer um, is is great. I mean, it, it, like like that's another just weird one that comes out of the blue with this kind of King Crimson kind of thing going on and mm-hmm. lots of weird time changes. I I just think with this album, it subverts expectations constantly, which is something I really really like. Yes. Um, and every sort of song is kind of a universe unto itself. They all have sort of unique ideas. When you, when you listen to Horsepower, right, the first tune, which is, like you said, crazy and dissonant, and then it goes into this kind of disco kind of breakdown. I don't know what you would call it at the end. It kind of sounds like Primus. Um, Date Rape Cookbook so. is like this, you know, syncopated kind of metal thing. Then you have Jane, Jane Whitfield's Dead, which is like kind of, I don't even know if you'd call it a ballad, but it's kind of folky. Republicans <laughs> in Love, which is this sort of, you know, it's just like it's, Every song sort of has uh, just a unique thing about it. You know, they don't really repeat themselves in terms of uh, the ideas. And I, and I would say also in terms of lyrical content, the lyrics are like just weird, cut up, hard to follow, strange references about the town these guys came from, uh, strange references about people that they know that you wouldn't know. And I just think like the 
how personal the lyrics are. I can't think of a metal band that really has lyrics that personal. I mean, I guess you would call this a metal record. I don't know what you would call it, a hardcore record or whatever, but the lyrics are just so personal. When you think about it in terms of the canon of albums released on Metal Blade Records in 1991, you don't think of too many like real personal kind of weird lyrical approaches. And um, I'm generally not a lyric person, but the lyrics of this band captivate me just because they're, they're so damn unique. Um, and uh, interesting, you know, there's a political bend to him. There's sort of, the, he's kind of dishing out his neuroses about, I guess, being addicted to drugs, being addicted to alcohol, his neuroses about the music industry, his, you know, it's, it's not stuff that people talk about, but it, he talks about it in such a frank and strange kind of way that uh, I can't, I, there's no other frame of reference that I can really think of for it. I, I, when Mike mentioned the, those stroke images, all I could think of, was uh, there's that YouTuber that's been getting popular recently for doing those AI generated lyric uh, so songs where he has AI listen to all of Nickelback's catalog oh, I and love then uses that, that to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they're, they're very good, very clever. Uh, and yeah, when Mike said that, I just thought that that could absolutely be where the lyrics came from for this. Maybe <laughs> someone had an AI listen to everything <laughs> Frank Zappa ever released mm -hmm. <laughs> and was like, right, Spit me out some lyrics. We've yeah. got the music done. I just need some lyrics to go over the top. Totally it's just, um, yeah, just, just out there. And you said metal record. Art record would be the only way I could describe this. Like, I can just imagine at any time you could go into, uh, like, a, um, like, an art gallery in New York and, um, <laughs> and this be playing. And it just fit in with that modern art aesthetic, even though it's from 91. I also love the idea of this going up in the charts against like you know nirvana <laughs> which <laughs> i know right it's so unbelievable like this it, i can't imagine a time where this would have been like the uh, you could play this to anyone and go what year do you think this came out and you just don't know what the exactly. where's this come from it's exactly it's yeah it, it's definitely like a time kind of like timeless is sort of like a not an adjective you could describe to most metal right because usually you could sort of see the genre you know hear the time period from a mile away. But this, in terms of production and the aesthetic and the vibe, it's just, yeah, it just, there's no other kind of rational reference point I can think of, especially on Metal Blade. Like, I wanted to look up and see what other records Metal Blade put out around that time, <laughs> uh, out of morbid curiosity. And just to see, like, I know these guys toured with Skinny Puppy. They toured with uh, Typo Negative. They, t they, you know, a can bunch of kind of unique, weird, weird bands. And, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just never caught on. I mean, I'm not surprised why yeah. <laughs> they didn't catch on um, because it's so strange. But I think in hindsight, uh, listening to it, they were just doing something so unique and so, so cool. Um, you know, obviously they did not give a shit. And another, another little cool bonus thing with the lyrics is that it's actually some of the tunes are written like a play, but you wouldn't know it unless you looked at the lyric book and saw like that a certain line is said by a certain character or whatever that he's, you know, um, it's just just really really cool. Everything from the Dolly album artwork to uh, you know the album title, which is very long. a mouthy one, <laughs> a mouthy one. Yeah, um, yeah. I just uh, I have a soft spot for this record, and you know it could be just because I've been listening to it for so long. But it, it's just that that thing. It's anytime I hear something that subverts my expectations in that genre, um, you've got my ears, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I, I'm glad you guys uh, listened to it with an open mind. I just can't imagine these guys opening up for anyone. Like, imagine going to a show and the opening band coming out and it just being this. And you say, like, oh, it's no wonder they didn't catch on. But they've released m more records than, uh, than Psychotic Waltz, haven't they? So yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> they've and, just uh, kept going. Funny backstory about them. Jason Newsted was actually instrumental in getting them signed to uh, Metal Blade Records. They, they had really? one record out before this. Um, called Songs for Insects, which I like just as much as this record. It's more metal. It's more like overtly prog. It's like sort of like a prog Mr. Bungle, I guess. There's lots of guitar solos. There's Chapman Stick. He's singing and playing Chapman Stick on it. Le it's way less hardcore. It's uh, um, definitely more on the, on the thrash tip. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. apparently, so they have a, a loose Metallica connection, which is very, very funny. Um, very loose. <laughs> yeah, very loose. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just think they're a unique band. And if you listen to their catalog, they sort of went in an, almost like an indie rock direction, but they were still on Metal Blade Records. Strangely enough, they must have just signed a huge deal with them and got stuck, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's a very, very unique, interesting band. So I wanted to talk to you guys. You know, I put you on the spot to pick these two albums. Was there any, any, were there any other albums that you guys were thinking, man, I should, have, I should have picked this one like after the fact. And maybe we could just like talk real quick about them so people can go check them out. 
Yes. I'll go first if you want, because sure. I have a quite a few. Yeah. Uh, one of the first ones was Meshuggah, Contradictions Collapse, the first album from 91. Oh, yeah. Weird, techy, thrash. I think it may have been standard tuning. Yeah. Like completely different for Destroyer Race and Proven Onwards. Completely oh, yeah. different. None, none has some of my favorite Meshuggah tunes, the EP that they, they throw at the end. You're talking about that's the reissue, right? That has both of them on it. It has the first album and, and the EP on it also. I right? think so. I yeah. think so. Um, um, and he sings on that shit too. Like he really he does. Yeah. I think that was probably the inspiration for um, Joe Duplantier from Gojira. Definitely. That yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Real Where good it's off fry vocals singing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, he's singing pitches, but it's still shredded up. It's great. Yeah. It's really good. Um, it is, it it is an underrated that, record. Totally, like 100%, especially in the metal category. I think a lot of people see Meshuggah and just think eight-string, crazy polyrhythmic, polymetric stuff, mm -hmm. unbelievable drums and guitar, syncopation, like can clearly play everything that well, but will still program it just for that one second of the music that sounds tighter. Mm -hmm. That madness uh, and like anything that's in the guitar is probably frothed at the mouth thinking about Frederick Thornton Doll's Manuel Kemper. Have you seen this crazy room in his studio? No, I haven't. You know Ampet, they do the amp switchers? Yeah. He has like eight of them in a rack and 64 heads or something all wired up to work at the one time and he can switch between any amp <laughs> at any time. It's an analog Kemper. It's fucking insanity. Right? That's crazy. So, his, crazy. uh, mentioning Frederick, his lead work too, uh, it's a little more pronounced and they give him a little more room to kind of like you know, his solos became sort of this kind of just like kind of chromatic weird stuff, but on mm -hmm. none, especially the lead work is phenomenal. Like he really, they just give him more room to shred than I heard on any other Meshuggah releases. You can hear um, a lot of the Alan Holdsworth and his playing that Big time. Really weird Big intervals time. and almost kind of synth style playing. I think sometimes Chris Poland does it a little bit as well at times. Yeah. That yeah. Kind of really clean bends and stuff. Um, but that's one that just is crazy. It's just sure. And I feel probably most people in the Meshuggah sphere, I, I would imagine, would go for Chaos Sphere. Probably, mm -hmm. right? Would that be the most heralded? I mean, my favorite is probably uh that uh twenty minute long song that they did. I or I, whatever. Yeah. Is the EP? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That that it's one is forever. that one is wild. Um, that's fucking cool. I but uh yeah, I mean that's totally Totally underrated uh, and just so different than if you're just used to listening to the Meshuggah of today, for sure. And that's what kind of caught or, or why I think it's underrated. I think when people mention Meshuggah, th that doesn't get enough thought compared to just instantly going to the start of gent, proto gent, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. My second nearly chosen choice, but wasn't, was a rare form by After the Burial. You would fucking hate it for production because it's very <laughs> Sumerian. Okay. But it's the first album with eight string guitars that I heard that didn't follow the same pattern as Meshuggah mm -hmm. or like Glass Cloud, where it's just we can go as low as we can. Um, that inspired me to want to play an eight string guitar and use it look for the extended range and not just for being low. Yeah, yeah. A bit of a baritone and have the same effect. Um, that was their first album. What, and what would you say it, it's about really the, you're saying like the approach of how they play the eight string in terms of like using it for like unique chords and stuff like that or uh um not so much a lot of it's kind of i don't want to say poppy but it's a lot of really conventional melody and quite shreddy like lead guitars harmonizing each other with the bass just underneath you know we're talking earlier on like the power trios but it's not so much like a backing track if there's guitar playing mm -hmm. or whatever yeah, yeah. If, the, if both of them are playing like a lead guitar part the guitars are locked super tight but there's not like a running guitar behind it. The bass is super low and fuzzy, but really, really thick and fits all, and fills it all out. Um, but it, it was just the fact that it wasn't just like dissonant, do -do 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 -do, you, you, like no, nothing that hooks you unless there's like a cool rhythm. Whereas this album had a bit of everything in my mind. It was really well written, progressive, techy stuff with some playful guitar in it. Really, really cool, like harmony lines and. Levi won't like the, the vocals either, I don't think, mm -hmm. probably. But the first recording of it, there's, there's two versions. There's the first one where the snare is almost like buried in the mix. It's so quiet. And then they re-recorded it with a new vocalist and put the snare up in the mix. 
if I could have the original vocalist and the new snare sound, I'd be super happy. <laughs> that album's just, it's ridiculous, man. Like, um, I can't even pick like a favourite song from it because it's just that good. It's 2008, Sumerian. Mm. But I kicked myself after I hadn't picked it because I'm like, fuck, like that, that's one that, again, I think it's maybe the, um, what I saw for the band, like the, the, the possibilities. They didn't go down a route that I was really necessarily big on. I, didn't, I like a lot of their further releases because they focus more on the extended range on the low end rather than the playful guitars. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this, oh, this album just ridiculous for me. It starts off with like a dual lead guitar and it's super tight, but it's really melodic and cool. Kind of neoclassical, but playful. And then when the vocals come in, it's like, kind of like, you know how Protest the Hero have the two guitars and they're constantly playing off each other and like riffing and soloing? Yeah. Imagine that with eight string guitars and a lot of really cool, groovy riffs and cool. interesting prog stuff. A- After the Burial is a name that I've definitely heard, but I've just never yeah. heard their music. I'll have to check You'll it out. You'll have heard the story of uh, Justin Lowe, their guitarist. He passed who, away, right? That's right. He was yeah. found, uh, I think, somewhere out, I don't know if it's in Nevada, but kind of desert side. Mm. Um, suspected he fell off the side of a rock after a bad mental episode. Jeez. Very sad story, man. Yeah. Really, like, it, he must have had a lot of problems because he was making allegations that, like, the, the, the CIA had taken his DNA and stuff. Mm. The guy was really unwell. It's really quite horrible. Yeah. They still gig to this day, um, and they haven't filled in the second guitarist part. I think for all the songs that he was on, they just t- have taken his stems. Yeah. And the other guitarist plays along with it, which is quite cool. I think that's really interesting. Um, and my third choice was, let me remember the name of the actual song. I saw the album. I can hear, you ever get that when you can see the art and everything and you just can't get it? I mean, we could, co- we could come right back to you while you're thinking if Levi has one. Yeah, I can blast some off. Yeah, into it. Go on, do it. Oh, oh into eternity, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, a Scattering of Ashes, I believe is the album title. Severe Emotional Distress is the first tune. Um, for people that like Iced Earth, you'll probably know Stu Block, the singer. Because uh, he is an Iced Earth now, but he's like, he's another vocalist that can do everything. And I mean, everything. I let Levi hear a little bit of this the other day when we were talking, sent him a link to it. Um, low gribbles, really high screams. He can sing, and his falsetto range, when it goes really high, is ridiculous and a lot of power. And there's videos of him doing like air raids, like Bruce Dickinson used to do, like just going yeah, yeah. in Jim Gillette style, smashing glasses, <laughs> like doing that, but going from like, really low to really high with a lot of power and a lot of great delivery um this one's maybe again rose tinted glasses because i really enjoyed it at the time i went back to listen to it and it's still pretty good but where i thought like oh man that guitar's cool as fuck and like that guy sounds exactly like himself but it's not to my tastes anymore mm-hmm. so that was that one and that's again a bit kind of progressive and it was the only album of theirs i really got into yeah they kind of had like a little bit of like um almost like painkiller era Judas Priest kind of thing going on, but with like, they, he did clean and harsh vocals, right? And they were like a little proggy also. I kind of remember yes. that sound. This album's pretty good. It's a good nostalgia listen because when you go back to it, you're like, oh, that sounds like all the metal around about then. Mm-hmm. But like in a good way, they still sound like themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Sorry. So that was my, my three that I missed out on. Cool. Solid picks. I'm going to give them a listen. Levi. I just uh, rapidly scrolled through my music uh, collection to see what I might might mm-hmm. jump out at me, and I had a few things jump out. Um, when we were talking earlier about cynic and that kind of, um, I don't even know what you'd call it, like sci-fi death uh, yeah. sound. <laughs> um, my old teacher Martin Goulding played in a band called Linear Sphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a couple of records out. The first one is very like cynic focus sound. Uh, but the second one, Man Vantara, uh, is a really cool record that features a vocalist that I'll never enjoy. But musically, it's totally there. And Martin Why would is, you never enjoy it? What, what is it about the vocals? It's that raspy, nasal, you know, I'm not a singer. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't like know Dave, how to Dave describe Mustaine? it. <laughs> it's um, someone that's been put on vocals that, they just needed a singer that's what it sounds like to me gotcha. um uh yeah I, if i remember a uh, dutch guy um so he's got a kind of accent anyway you, i mean check him out you you'll know what i mean as soon as you hear it um and that's a deep album it's not deep for me because i'm not 
like Captain Superstoner, but Martin Goulding is Captain Superstoner, right? So when it came to him sitting and writing this album and it, all, all of his, uh, all, all of the lyrical themes, they were all very important to him. And he, he wanted to delve very deep into all these concepts of constellations and planetary alignment and all, all these things that Martin likes to sit and think about. So that, that'd be one that I would um, throw out there. So that's Man Vantara by uh, Linear Sphere. And that's uh, it, that you could find that one streaming? Or is that I, something that... Uh, I'm sure that'll be... I should have checked, really. Linear Sphere. You've yeah, yeah, it's my, on, uh, peaked my on Spotify. Let me check it out. Okay, cool. They're on Spotify. Uh, only, only Man Vantara is on Spotify, apparently. That came out in 2012. Uh, thinking back to my childhood, I remember buying an album from uh, The Agony Scene. I bought an album called The Darkest Red. Uh, that's a really good record. I don't really know how to describe it other than it being, you know, kind of not really metal core, but, but heavy. And with this one, I liked the singer. Um, he always sounded like an angry goblin to me. There was a, a rasp to the, to the way he would sing. Um, ah, stay away from my gold. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they sing a lot um, about gold. That's yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the darkest red, uh, but the other two will be ones that you'll both be more familiar with, but maybe our listeners aren't. Uh, one would be uh, Blotted Science, mm-hmm. Ron Giles on, mm-hmm. um, and the first album they put out, The Machinations of Dementia, I think it's called. Um, I really love Ron's writing style. I really like his um, kind of... Madness. It, well, it's it's the kind of development of the serialist concepts, serialism. He's really kind yeah, of tried to He has to his own something. unique take on serialism. It's like not uh, exactly by the books shown in exactly. serialism. He's got exactly. His own it's, take on it. it's not second, second School Viennese composition. Like it's, yeah. he's, but that's cool to me because when I studied all of that stuff in, in school, like high school, I was like, this is really cool. Why haven't people gone on to do more with this? And it's, well, it's music that's designed to break all the rules by following a lot of rules. And it mm-hmm. felt like it was explored. And then for Ron to come along and, and just go, okay, well, let me try and do something weird with this. Uh, he has a surprisingly musical result at the end of it. And yeah. I really, yeah, I, I admire him for that. And I really, really like that record. Uh, if you check out on YouTube there, are, most of that was written, you know, with film in mind. So there are, there's certainly um, visual accompaniments that are going on in Ron's mind. They were written to music, but there's a really great example of one of the tunes from, I'm sure it's that one. It may actually be from the follow up EP that was uh, around one of the scenes from King Kong, the, the one that Jack Black and who else is in that film? I can see the guy, Adrian Brody. I think Adrian Brody's in that. He might not be in that. Uh, but Jack Black certainly in it. So yeah, Machinations of Dementia. And finally, mentioned them on the podcast last week, mm-hmm. uh, the Heavy Metal Ninjas. Heavy the Heavy Metal, Metal Ninjas, Ninjas Interstellar Abduction. I just the checked, Metal right? Ninja. That came out in 2013, right? So that album's seven years old already. And there's still no follow-up. Richie Allen is just one of those freak beasts. I'm not massively into extended range guitar stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I heard that band where it was all of the Steve Vai and Jason Becker esque lead guitar stuff, but then the rhythms with just these super tight low end eight string, like gently grooves. Um, that was the first time where I instantly went, yep, yeah, this is something that I'm, this eight string thing is cool. It speaks to me because it's going behind these kind of shrapnel esque things that I grew up listening to. Um, and I still love that record. Very confused why there isn't a follow up. Checked mm-hmm. Richie Allen out on Facebook a couple of days ago, actually, and he's not posted anything in like a year. So who I, knows? I've heard you mention them and, and him specifically a bunch of times. I got, I got to check it out. You, know, yeah. sp- you always spoke very highly of them. They've got, a, a, you know, an instantly unique sound. I think I, I always I'm... confuse them with 12 foot ninja though. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Which is Another unfortunate. Um, weirdly it's... unique band. Hmm? Yeah. Another weirdly unique band. Yeah. And that like kind of genre bending style. I, uh, yeah. I have a couple that I'll mention that, that I was, uh, you know, toying with before I gave you the ones that I picked. Um, so now in terms of Ron Jarzombek, I would always lean towards that first Spastic Inc. record, the one that was totally instrumental. Incomplete, I think, was the one. Uh, and then they had Inc. Compatible. Incompatible. Which, which was yeah, the was the second one. So um, I like that for the rawness of it. You know, and again, I just, that really appeals to me. Production-wise, it was a little less modern than... Um, something like blotted science, which is cool, but like my ears always gravitate towards the raw in, in, in general. 
Um, but Ron's always cooking up great stuff. It seems like he's always everything. I hear a definite like Carl Stalling influence on his music. You know, he's the guy who wrote the Looney Tunes music. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. 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 And oh, you've, uh, you've seen it synced up a wild hair with the actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Page. So and he's like, been um, he's been doing this whole thing for a while. Serial uh, mouse as well. Yeah, yeah. Of all of his stuff that he's put out, my favorite isn't actually even the blotted science stuff. It's his second solo album, uh, solitary speaking of theoretical confinement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I love that record. I think that's a great record. But it's um, it's arty. You know, he's he's um. You, with every song on that you can read the title and then try and work out what the musical concept in the song is going to be and i i, I always enjoyed that so yeah big yeah yeah it, it's it's very very cool it's definitely aimed at a music nerd sort of audience but uh yeah. unabashedly so but <laughs> it, it's cool stuff i mean and even watchtower i mean i wouldn't say that's an underrated record control and resistance um everybody kind of knows about that record but again that's just some very creative metal guitar playing um on that record i i so my picks that i were thinking of one uh was a band called spiral architect they had an album called a skeptics universe so i uh, know that name i could describe these guys uh, they're on that lineage of the watchtower cynic psychotic waltz kind of thing um or did not same idea as them as well yeah 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 um and uh just probably some of the craziest techiest metal i've ever heard with like lots of very obtrusive fretless bass but it kind of works in a really cool way and they're also not afraid to groove i think they have good hooks um it's a little like sort of tongue-in-cheek i guess but if you can get, get past it uh there's some really really great moments on there um going back in the time machine even further um so you know like i said we don't need to talk about megadeth or metallica or even like testament or any of these classics but i will say annihilator never never land Annihilator's second record. If you can get past some really terrible vocals, um, you will find I can't. <laughs> you will find a very very creative thrash metal album um, that I think is pretty pretty unique. And I I always thought that Jeff Waters, which is so underrated in terms of a rhythm guitar player and metal, just so so tight. Um, cool writing, like fun tunes, and uh, they they sing about really funny things. Like there's a tune about drunk driving on there. I forget what the hell the name of it is, but just <laughs> Uh, uh, just an absolute ripper of a guitar solo and almost kind of like rockabilly kind of influence in a certain way. Like he's got all these double stops and cool kind of stuff. Um, but uh, that was a really great one that, that sprung to mind immediately when I think of metal albums that uh, haven't got any credit. I know there's probably, God, there's, there's so many. If I just look at my collection, I have most of that stuff sort of packed away somewhere. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I, know, I know the feeling like when you picked this, I had albums in mind and they just weren't metal albums. I needed to come back and go, right, what is the brief here? Like, help yeah. me out because I can pick things from so many genres. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I just thought the, 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 the inherent nostalgia of talking yeah. about uh, a metal album, it just always, it's, it's fun, you know what I mean? And uh, this is good because it's, it also sort of got me a, on, a, on a kick now where I've like, you know, oh, I'm going to check out some other faceless stuff. I'm going to check out, oh, this Zach Wilde has like, you know, 10 albums I've never heard. I'm going to check this out. <laughs> and he was um, a ripping singer and songwriter when he wanted to be. Yeah, he, yeah, for sure. I, I, uh, but, you know, I, I, I was pleasantly surprised uh, by all the picks in, in some way or another. So it was, uh, I think it was really, really good. And um, it was fun chatting with you guys as always. I had a great time. We were Thank talking so about doing some kind of Guitar Souls unemployed crossover at some point. So if anybody has an, any ideas of what uh, they might want us to bullshit about, you know, we obviously love bullshitting. So please throw them in the comments and let us know, uh, you know, if you uh, have something specific that you want three men with hairy faces to talk about, we will be those three hairy men. I meant it. Uh, anything you guys want to talk about before uh, we depart? Anything you want to plug besides obviously the fantastic podcast you guys have, Guitar Souls, which is on every streaming platform, I think. I listen on Spotify, but I'm sure it's... Uh, I'm sure it's everywhere. I love making Mike blush. Um, <laughs> it's, it's easy to be fair, man. I've got like the rosiest red cheek on the planet. <laughs> I, I mean, I would say plugging band stuff. I know Mike's, Mike had a big tour canceled with Party Cannon, but is there anything else uh, you guys want to mention coming up on, on the periphery that we need to know about? Um, nothing immediate, but we're hoping to be recording our next album, which was hoped to have been done this year in January. So we should hopefully see that next year. Um, not any titles really we've wrote all the music though um and i'll bring it up your street in the terms of like not going cgi mm -hmm. all the artwork is generally done by us 
as low budget as possible and as really terrible as possible, like a total nod to like what well, you guys Peter have Jackson the best brain dead. You guys have the best logo I've ever seen. Can we just say that? Whenever I see festival posters with party can on on it, it's the <laughs> fucking funniest thing. You have this big colorful logo. It's great. It's great. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, also, the, shows, the best the best cover for any of your albums as well. Every single thing you put out always just has hilarious cover work on. So very we'll creative. Ne- we'll, we'll never top part lead in half. Will yeah. you not? The other soft, white, soft white gelatinous body. <laughs> that was a single. Yeah, but and it's got you not wearing clothes on it. <laughs> it has. Lion blooms. <laughs> um, that was totally sporadic. We were taking photos and just decided to strap off and lie in the blooms, think I was being funny. And all of a sudden, it became a single cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, just working on new album. Hopefully, we'll have something out soon. We've got most of the songs, if not all the songs, written. Just need to work on them. I've been learning them. They are fucking difficult. Um, but some really cool, interesting riffs. Some really, really, really fast shit. Um, aye, should be interesting. A lot of good groove, too. Yeah, I'm excited to hear it. And, you know, any, any guys who are fans of... Uh, What's well, a good reference point? I would say maybe Dying Fetus, stuff yeah. like that. Um, yeah. Party Cannons like that. It's got the groove and they've yeah, also bring the brutality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Levi, anything coming down the pipeline for you? More YouTube videos, getting angry okay. about things on the internet. Yeah. I've, I've given up the idea of trying to make music that people listen to and enjoy because I did that and I found that people are more entertained by me. <laughs> trying to entertain them you know <laughs> um so no I'm, I'm putting a lot more effort into guitar souls related stuff now because um i enjoy it it's a good it's, it's there's nothing better than sitting down and getting to chat with your pal you know and having sure. having a good time and laughing a lot um <laughs> so yeah it's mainly that we we've got some like audio stuff that we're working on some cover material that we're looking to put out but awesome. uh no Oops, musically it's yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Musically, it's um, uh, very little. Uh, you know, more more books, more YouTube videos, more collaborations, more uh, more making pe- more making people I like laugh and people I don't like feel very uncomfortable. That's yeah. really <laughs> that's a, that's a great. I mean, you could put that on your CV, Levi. That's a, when I think about when I think about Levi, that's what I think about. And like he mentioned, he has a bunch of great books on Amazon. He has some on country guitar, blues guitar, slide guitar, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, highly recommended. He's a great educator, great guitar player, great guy. And uh, these two guys have such a great rapport. I always love listening to them on Guitar Souls. It really is a shame that we don't live closer together because, like I said, the bullshit that would ensue would probably... Uh, Just move over here. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do it, Levi. Come to Bushy. At, at this point, I got to get the fuck out of here. God. <laughs> our, Unfortunately, our, our, nowhere else in the world will take you at the moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, we've got a scarlet letter if you're from the United States. You know, that, that's a great place to end. Not to overextend this, but um, I mean, you see the US is just absolutely exploding with this COVID thing. I mean... So from, from people outside of the U.S., what is your perspective on the United States right now? Do not hold back, because I think people need to hear the reality check of what we look like right now. Well, I think um, it, it, you can't really, in the same way that like um, when you're dealing with a racist and you have to turn around to them and say, not all black people or not all Muslims, you have to do the same here. You have to say not all Americans. Like mm-hmm. I, I deal with, most of my business is in America and most of the people I work with and, and deal with on, on a day-to-day basis are, are Americans. And they are not the same people that the rest of the world sees painted in, in mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, they do form a significant portion of your country. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know what Said to say. Said very diplomatically, Levi. Yeah, I don't like to be diplomatic, but at the same time, like, <laughs> you, you can't personally be beholden to the decisions that are made by whoever's running your country. In the same way, like, our, our government are making terrible decisions over here, just like abhorrent How, is, how has Boris been, been handling this whole thing? It has I mean, been, or has he been handling it? Yeah, terribly, yeah. terribly, but comparatively fantastically compared to the US, you know? Yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can really, really say. Like, yeah, sure. I can certainly look at a lot of things that go on in America and say, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, but then I remember that it's not individuals. It's, um, there are individuals, but they're not people that I'm dealing with. So education is more important than, um, than anything else. So just educate yourself a little bit, put your beliefs aside and focus on learning a little bit more and maybe things will move in the right direction. But you know, you've got a goddamn constitutional right to not have to educate yourself. So, you know, if you want to exercise those rights, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. Mike, any, any closing comments in that? You know me, man. I, I, rip, 
into bad <laughs> government just as much in the US as I do I'm giving the you the political it's stance yeah. that you desire, you know, that you desire, the, the podium. The, the hates, yeah, the exactly. You had to ban it on, the, on our show. So. I, I know, I know. So that, <laughs> I see the joy in Mike's face right now. That's, that's why when I get the wee opportunity to just put like, fuck it, I can't just do it. I know he's going to cut it. But anyway, I can't so. edit that out. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, no, in all seriousness, right, I, I worry for the majority of Americans. I worry for all Americans, but there are people who are, as Levi put it, basically at the behest of other people's choices, and it's not sure. fair. Um, mm. I grow increasingly worried for everybody in the US the more I see Donald Trump make decisions and changes and steps towards what may as well be authoritarianism. Um, the most recent yeah. being in Portland, Oregon, with those undercover, no badge, no knock, no warrant, mm -hmm. drag you off the street. Yeah. private militia secret service or, or secret police essentially it's like the yeah. Gestapo that's some it, frightening it, shit it's, it's very George Orwell right very <laughs> much so and then for like Homeland head of operations to just be like I don't need an invite like I, I think well, did, uh, Portland's mayor not get tear gassed in the midst of all of this yeah crazy totally crazy but that's not to say the UK has got it fucking great we are mm -hmm. sailing down the river to extreme poverty and probably the worst financial crash we could ever imagine in the midst of a global pandemic and the majority controlling stakeholder let's say England and Boris Johnson and Westminster are doing fuck all about it yeah. except being like wash your hands and sing happy birthday <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just it's now, do, you do you think the financial situation there is a byproduct of um is it i you know in the u.s they could sort of you know pinpoint into the the fed just artificially inflating our economy uh to try to make the market look better until it eventually pops which is the theory but i don't know what the story is over there by you guys i think for both countries there's a quick and easy solution and it is universal basic income when you give big companies tax bailouts or sorry, bailouts, and they're not paying tax for the majority of these companies anyway, that money goes back into their bank accounts and is hidden somewhere. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're giving lots of people a thousand, two thousand dollars a month, they go out and spend that money because they have no choice but to spend the money on commodities, on uh, services, gas, food, energy, internet services, phones, going out to restaurants. So the only way the economy is going to work is if money is passing hands. Yeah, there's no liquidity to giving a company that's got all this money and stakeholders and shares. Yeah, I think research, like a vault, you know what I mean. Corporate resource resource guarding, I guess you would say, is a big issue. And the and the argument against that, right, is that, uh, well, basically everything's so expensive to make in the United States or so expensive in the UK, right, that they need to outsource it and they need to utilize these tax loops to try to turn a profit, and that if they're you know, if there weren't so many restrictions, right, then they would be able to reinvest this money into the economy, right, which I call bullshit on because uh, you just, you don't see that happening. You see more resource guarding. When we have, you know, multi-trillionaires at this point in the world, uh, you know, something, uh, something's not adding up into the, you know, where I don't buy the corporate benevolence sort of thing that people are, I guess the libertarian viewpoint of how things should run. I just, I don't, I don't no. subscribe to that as reality, you know? I th in my mentality, I'm, in my mind, there's, no one said you can't have millionaires or billionaires, but you certainly shouldn't have a very small minority controlling the wealth of the world. Mm. Everybody, you, 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 we should not have poverty. We should not have child poverty. We should not have homelessness. Eh, homelessness sorry. The UK is following suit towards the US in terms of healthcare. I feel that it's going to get to the point where it's either a chargeable service or it's just if you are wealthy enough to have private uh, health care, then you'll be fine. But if you're at the behest of the NHS, then it's just your luck. should never yeah. be that way. Um, I think it's disgraceful that it's there's been such a divide made of the, I would even say the affluent working class being made out to be middle class and lumped in with the middle class. They are then targeting the working class and the poor because they've been demonized by the rich that the middle class think they're part of. Mm -hmm. And essentially they went, you have a class war and we're just going to scalp everything else at the top end. Yeah. Jeff Bezos, like you could tax that guy for like one year of his earnings and probably get rid of child poverty yeah. across the world. Yeah. Uh, that's going to come to some sort of weird head at some point in the next 10 years.
Oh, he he broke records. He made what it was something like he made thirteen billion dollars profit in one day. Uh, yep, I was reading earlier that this day, week. That's right. Yeah, that's just like. Um, that's a let them eat cake scenario <laughs> like <laughs> head, there's going to come a point where heads are going to roll uh, like there is no possible reason to ever need that much money no possible got, reason to ever need that much. To i like it. having money mm -hmm. but there's no possible reason to ever have. i can't imagine having even one percent of his wealth and not still wanting well, to you, give most of it away you can't even fathom that much money yeah. you really you really can't like it, it's on paper it's one thing but when you really see just the sheer math of how much wealth yeah. that is, how you can never really. And uh, it's next level greed to have that much wealth and then still feel the need to avoid paying as much tax as possible on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you are avoiding paying tax on money that you will never ever get to spend anyway. Oh. Like it's just going, it's just a number on a sheet at this point and you're glad that it's there, but you could be taxed a hundred percent of what you earn this year and you'll never, there'll never come a point in your life where you'll go to buy something and go, fuck, if only I wasn't taxed that bit, bit of money there. Like it's astonishing. Astonishing. Yeah. It's very That's astonishing. Wild. Yeah. And I think you, you brought it kind of full circle to a perfect point. I hope for and foresee some form of civil disobedience resulting in some form of revolution whether that be a gentle revolution where things go to normal and the powers that be realise, well, the people can and will march and take action when they need to. Um, saying that, I am grossly disappointed in myself and a lot of other people in the UK that there's not any civil action, civil disobedience, mm. strikes or anything like that. And just as disappointed with a lot of the American uh, population who believe in the Second Amendment because they're not doing what the amendment actually says. The whole point of gun ownership is against a tyrannical government. If you want to own guns because you think they're cool, that's fucking great. But you can't ignore the fact that this is written into your rights to avoid what's actually happening right now. Mm -hmm. And these people are going the opposite direction. They're defending what the police and private armies and private militias are essentially doing when only last month they were claiming this right so they could argue about going to a hairdresser's. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not the majority, it's certainly not everybody that has a gun or is interested in gun ownership or has any guns training that feels that way. But the loud minority and the very front line minority aren't painting right picture for gun ownership. Yeah. And I mean, it's not as if the NRA are going to do anything positive about it. Let's, let's not lie about well, it. You, well, yeah, the NRA doesn't have to um, because they have so many politicians sort of in in their grasp in terms of uh you know yep. it, it's just so much cronyism going on so nothing's going to change and and you know people will always get guns if they want guns they'll find a way to get them illegally right we know that that and that's typically the argument of gun restrictions but that doesn't mean that we can't make it harder like in terms of more rigorous sort of um you know things that you have to uh you know restrictions that you have to meet before you can own a gun just like yep. driving a car right that's it's it's harder to get a license than it is to get a gun um yeah, you know and and, and that, process, that yeah. that's that's kind of that's kind of crazy to me i don't think it would infringe on anybody's second amendment right if just a little more care was taken uh in in the process of procuring a gun yes. and, but again this is like a you know it's a very nuanced hard thing to, to handle but the the it's very I, emotional too yeah, very emotional. And I, I totally think if someone wants to own a gun and, and have it to protect their house, like, you know, by all means. Do, but do I think people need, like, these elaborate automatic weapons? I, I can't think of a reason personally why anybody would need that. But, you know, uh, somebody with like a belt fed M240 yeah. at the you, front door. I mean, for enjoyment. I guess. Yeah. And, and yeah. for me, like, I think that's where that argument always falls down the most. And I'm, I, we may have said this on the guitar sales, right? But I think yeah. uh, when you look at, like, cars. Yeah that go fast. Mike, Mike's got a, a very fast car, right? And there's no I'll possible justification. I was certainly faster than mine. My car no longer exists because it went too fast. Um, no, that's actually not true. Someone drove 26 into 26 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Mike's car can go very fast and it can go from very slow to very fast, very quick, right? And it goes faster than there's any reason for him to be able to, for it to go, right? That's fair. Yeah. You could argue that there's no reason for it to do that. Therefore, it shouldn't be able to do that. But there's no justification that he needs other than i want it and i think far too many americans are too scared to just look at guns and say i fucking like guns i want to own guns in the same way that i own a ridiculous collection of guitars i don't need as many guitars as i have but i want them i want yeah. them all 
and that's my that is my right as somebody who has money and can go out and buy things and what i work for things and I, and I buy things and you know if you want to go out and own lots and lots of guns by all means go out and lots and lots of, uh, buy lots and lots of guns but don't pretend it's for any reason other than you like guns don't say it's to you know protect your family from a tyrannical government <laughs> you just like guns that's fucking okay that's a mm -hmm. totally good like own as many guns as you like be a responsible gun owner cool some people do like them for the idea of a tyrannical government the sad truth is though they're the same people that build like bomb shelters and are like, like <laughs> end of earthers but where have they been like oh there's a tyrannical government uprising i know i'll hide in my bunker <laughs> well it's it's because they feel that the tyrannical government is on their side and that is insane <laughs> what, what, mean, what, are, what are, i assume the, mm -hmm. I'm sorry sorry to interrupt you mike i assume right. by you guys like uh you can't walk into a walmart and buy a gun right like you can here you can I buy wouldn't. guns here but you need to buy a gun to. license you need to have yeah. a background check you need yeah. to fit really serious requirements as to why you have it you need to be like a farmer or it needs to be for hunting and you can only get up to a certain caliber you get a handgun license then i think you can get a shotgun license separate and then you can get a rifle license separate your guns must be kept in a certain specific rated gun box it has to be located in a certain place in your house it has to be attached to a certain type of wall with certain screws your ammunition must be kept separate the guns must mm. be kept with the safety on like all these things and you also give up the right to the police needing a warrant to check specifically for guns on the property if you are a, a legal gun owner they can just come on at any time and go spot checking you just to make sure your license is clean you've got everything right and if they discover anything like you've not locked your gun rack or the guns loaded in the gun rack like they can just so it's similar to like the, how the fda can go into a restaurant and and do a check you know without them realizing if they find something yeah, pretty yeah. Much. and like to a, give you an idea of how how tightly regulated it is uh, like me and mike had a friend uh, who's in his mid-30s recently have a license application for an air rifle uh, rejected because on his record he has a uh, a note of drinking in the streets when he was 16. Mm. So yeah. that that was enough reason for them to go no. <laughs> yeah, I, no and, and, you, you, you know what that go. that to me even though that seems a little extreme just the idea of having a fraction of those regulations that you guys have in our country I I feel like would be so helpful and still I don't think would I I mean I just can't see how someone who is claiming well I'm a responsible gun owner I'm using it for this I'm using it for that so if you're being a responsible gun owner why would you be against any any of those types of regulations if you have nothing to you know yeah i i don't know it's just it, the, it's the, confusing you have to weigh it up against the the payoff which is um at no point in my life i don't have kids mm -hmm. uh kids yet but at no point in my life as while i was growing up or if i were to have kids now i've never ever gone to school and been worried that i might die today you know what i mean yeah like that's that's never been a concern and and it's just a totally different mindset where that is something that you need to be concerned about. Something very bad rude, could yeah. happen to me today, um, living in the States. So, um, yeah, that I, I, the idea of like how involved the government can be with us over here, I'm not crazy on it. I'm not crazy mm. on it. And I think that, um, the constitution that you guys have over there provides you with a lot of freedoms that overrule anything that your government would try and do to, for, to you. They are there for your protection of your freedoms. And I admire that and wish we had that here, but also at the same time, I have to look at our situation and go, um, yeah, we don't have these fears. And it's baffling to me that, well, I know many people can, but widely a lot of people that you speak to over the pond can't comprehend mm -hmm. that just complete lack of fear of going to school. <laughs> it's just yeah. not a thing. It's just yeah. not a thing. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, or if I'm walking through a, a rough neighborhood, like the the rough neighborhood is, someone might pull a knife on me. They might do, you know, but I'm definitely not going to get shot. It's just not going to happen. If I upset someone, if I offend someone in a bar, they're not going to go out because they're drunk. Go home, get their gun, come back and shoot me. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. Knife crime so, used yeah. to be a really big problem here, um, and credit where credit's due. The Scottish police force, I think it was a Strathclyde police at the time, they were called, tackled it in a really sensible way. They went, well, the problem here is culture. It's not the fact that young people are carrying knives, the fact that they feel they need to, and it's either for protection or literally for intimidation and to use. Mm -hmm. So we went from having a really, really, I think, the highest knife crime statistics in Europe, in Glasgow, to virtually none. And it's because the police went into schools and did a lot of essentially youth work and social work and like activities where they would give two kids 
uh, they put make them wear like a white shirt and give them like a like a permanent marker with no lid and be like right pretend they're knives fight each other and then like they would see where they'd be slashed all over and how inaccurate it would be and be like like that you've slit your own wrist there like that's you you've done this you've done this damage to yourself mm. and just to give them an idea of like you're not a ninja yeah and it's certainly like you need to know the dangers of you doing this and also the stupidity of it um <laughs> I don't mean that like disrespectfully, but it is like there's a, there was a really really bad culture here for quite a few years of just street fighting and like groups of people having territorial fights and they would meet in parks that were in between two towns or two villages or even two housing estates mm-hmm. um, and just fight and like bring fucking hammers and <laughs> knives. That, I swear to God samurai swords for a, a period of time do you like, think that, that really all this crazy that. shit is is that was the byproduct of uh drugs in glasgow because i know i think heroin was a kind of a big problem i mean we got warned about that but i don't know nah man religion <laughs> the sectarianism really over I, here I, is that, yeah yeah <laughs> levi's going to notice it a lot at the moment especially this year um with football having such a kind of tumultuous thing there's there's Celtic and Rangers, the two mm-hmm. big Glaswegian teams, the old firm, probably the the oldest rivalry and the biggest rivalry, in, at least in football slash soccer, if you want to call it that, like in the world. Everybody knows those two teams, especially in New York. There's obviously a lot of like Celtic bars and mm-hmm. places like Yonkers and stuff. Yeah. Um, in Boston too. Yeah. It's a, it's a big thing. Like if you are irish catholic by yeah. any sort of descent you're probably into glasgow celtic and if you're protestant and have any connections to scotland you probably know of rangers um but that's what it boils down to it's catholicism versus protestantism and there is a really horrible bitter bubbling undercurrent certainly in glasgow and scotland um and at the moment it's been amplified celtic were given an award that they I don't want to say they didn't earn, but it was based on like predictions of how the, the rest of the league would have went because COVID shut it down. And it went from being this kind of playful back and forth Celtic versus Rangers. Some of it was like on the surface banter and jokes and just like rivalry and friendly competition mm-hmm. to this right back to like the troubles in Ireland style of real horrible vitriol. And I think at the moment, that's going to flare up as well in Scotland. But Levi's right. That is what the big problem in Scotland was. It was, hmm. but, but, but to anyone, to any American listeners that are listening to this now and saying, well, you know, that, that proves my point. Like I, I need a gun to protect myself. You'd also make the argument that, you know, well, bad people are still going to get guns. Are they? <laughs> like, do they, do, is that a thing over here? Is there mass? Do all the are all the villains out on the street armed with pistols? No, isn't guns are hard shootings. to come by, and they're ridiculously expensive if you could come by one. Mm. And another thing that a lot of people probably don't realise is there is way, way more covert police operations looking for these things than you would ever know. Mm. I, I, the Unmarked, equivalent would be like vehicles. as if if you were out in the states and someone said can you can you look after this for me and you and you said what is it and they gave you a kilo bag of heroin Mm -hmm. and just said can you just keep that like for me for a while that's the equivalent over here of you harboring a gun (laughs) it's just everyone knows it's just not worth it it's still not worth it yeah yeah. you're not going to use it because then you'll go to prison for the rest of your life and um if you if you're found to have it (laughs) same same fate you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. so why bother well, there, there, there are still shootings in Scotland, but they are very few and far between. And when they happen, they happen because someone was a target. There was one in my hometown, which was, a, I, I think my mum and dad actually heard it from their house because it was like maybe a couple of, we say schemes here, like almost streets away. And like, and like imagine American residential areas, like a kind of white picket mm-hmm. kind of area, a couple of streets away, what we would call them schemes or estates and there'd be different parts to it um not far from mom and dad stayed and it was a son of shotgun that was used and the person who was intended to be shot it was mistaken identity and it was somebody else was killed but that's the only shooting i've heard of in glasgow slash lanarkshire in 10 years that's not been wow. linked to something else you know what i mean that's that's great I, I mean i'll give you a little story uh 
before before we uh, call it a day here, uh, we used to practice in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, which is uh, kind of a rough neck of the woods, a lot of crime. And uh, but we had our percussionist come over to rehearse with us. He was going to do a gig with us. And uh, we come downstairs, and all the windows in his car were smashed out, and he had a bunch of gear that he was taking to a gig after the rehearsal. He had a bunch of drums and all kinds of other stuff, electric marimba, all these things, uh, all stolen from his car. So we were like, oh, fuck. So we called the cops, and they're like, we'll be over there soon. And we're waiting. Hour comes by. No one's there. We're waiting a little more. Kind of getting nervous because it's not the best area to just be loitering in. And uh, we call the cops again. And the cop, I remember, got mad at my friend. And he's like, he's like in the past hour, we have, we've had six shootings. He's like, it's going to be a while before we, you know, come and check out this car. I'm sorry. So we actually had to just leave. And, uh, and a couple of days later, go to the police station and get the report. I mean, so if that gives you any indication of how kind of out of control it can be in certain areas in the States, I mean, that, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. nuts. Yeah, it's crazy. very crazy. So a little bit of doom and gloom <laughs> for the audience. But, uh, you know, we will prevail somehow, some way. Be Anything excellent to each do. other. Be excellent to each other. <laughs> when I'm on dudes. bad days, I think the only way through i sorry, the only way out is through. Yeah. But this is the only way through is out, but it doesn't make any sense. The only way out is through. You need to get through this shit. You just need to plod on. Yeah. The best you can do is laugh, smile, talk to your good friends, listen to some cool music. <laughs> listen to the, the guitar souls, unemployed, yeah, things like that. Th the important things in life. Um, thank you guys so much for chatting with me. Uh, it's always a blast hanging with you guys. And uh, I look forward to whatever, whatever thing we uh, end up cooking up together. It should be fun. I've got some ideas. Don't you worry. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> that, that dance, very provocative, yet very alluring at the same time. Titties Le dancing. <laughs> Levi Clay, Mike McLaughlin, give it up for them. I'm going to put in the, the sound of an applause here to make you guys feel appreciated. Uh, thank you, guys. Tune in next week for another episode. Check these guys out on all streaming platforms, The Guitar Souls. Two gems over here. Levi Clay, Mike McLaughlin, thank you, guys. Thanks, Tom. All right, we're good. Thank you guys for doing this. No worries. Welcome, man. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. That man. was fun. Yeah, that was fun, man. That was fun.